Oh, you saw the, okay. Okay, the install did it. Uh, but I don't know where it went. Uh, that was from the other day, right? Yeah. Okay. That was so just. Uh, okay. I've seen that issue. I've seen that issue. I've seen that issue. I've seen that issue. Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's from Channel 9. This reminds me, I was on 15 years ago. It didn't be the Michael was just like this. Where the house office is in. Right, where uh, Michael Brown was. Oh, you, I didn't know you were there? Yeah. Did you look out the window? Yes, because he sold his house on the other side of the park. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, but we were. We got to see the video somewhere once. We didn't get the sign on the island, but of course they had to be I mean, I think it was probably like 10 days. Okay. Because then they had to be harassed. But anyway, yeah, the written house was huge. Huge, yeah. I've been going down in here and meet it like a and they were all wireless. At, well, no, at that time they didn't have all those. Oh, they were. Like they three were years mechanical. ago, they were mechanical. Yeah. But there were so many readers. So I'm thinking, when I look at this, I'm thinking, okay, they have to change all the readers to these readers. Like, what that looks like. All this this was. What is it taking That's what I want to say. This is. Uh, I mean, what is this? A guy in Connecticut Avenue condo. Okay, okay. okay and okay, okay. the guy who lives yeah. on the other side of the wall, like Winston, is the head of the condo association. And he bought an RF measuring mm -hmm. machine. So my, my first customer was the premise of the argument that there should be a little bit of money
for the work. Kenya McDuffie, Council Member for Ward 5 and Chair of the Committees, the Council's Committee on Government Operations. Today is Thursday, April 25th, 2013, and we are in room 123 of the John Wilson Building. The time is now 10.27 a.m. I'm calling to order this hearing on the Committee of Government Operations. Today we'll be holding our third round of budget oversight hearings regarding the Mayor's proposed fiscal year 2014 budget. As many of you know, the Mayor submitted his proposed budget to the Council on March 28th of this year. The Council is now tasked with examining the Mayor's proposal and marking up the budget. These budget oversight hearings play a pivotal role in ensuring that district dollars are being expended in the most efficient, effective, and cost-effective manner. Uh, as such, we'll be hearing from the following agencies today. The Office of the People's Council, the Public Service Commission, the Office of Partnerships and Grant Services, and the Department of General Services in that order. And we're going to be hearing from our public witnesses uh, first, followed by our government witnesses, we're going to begin uh, the hearing with the Office of the People's Council. And I'd like to say 
before we hear from our witnesses, that the mission of the Office of People's Council is to advocate for the provision of safe and reliable quality utility services and equitable treatment at rates that are just, reasonable, and non-discriminatory to assist individual consumers in disputes with utility providers, provide technical assistance, education, and outreach to consumers and rate payers, community groups, associations, and the Consumer Utility Board, and provide legislative analysis and information to the Council of the District of Columbia on matters relating to utilities. The office's mission further includes consideration of the district's economy and promotion of the environmental sustainability of the district. The office is funded by an annual budget allocation, and the fiscal year 2014 operating budget request is approximately $6.5 million, an increase of approximately 7%. In addition, the office is requesting an increase in FTEs and intends to execute its mission in fiscal year 2014 with 38.4 FTEs. And as I said earlier, after hearing from our public witnesses, uh, we'll hear testimony of the Office of People's Council led by Ms. Sandra Matabu Fry. I'd like to call up, uh, I don't see Mr. Michael Syndrome, I do see uh, Chris Turner, who is present to begin with. And if there are any other public witnesses who would like to testify to the budget of the Office of People's Council who have not already signed up, uh, please come forward now. Mr. Turner, you can uh, have a seat and begin whenever you're ready. Good morning. Good morning, Council Member McDuffie. Good morning to everybody in the audience. My name is Chris Turner. I'm a lawyer here in Washington, D.C. I grew up in Tacoma, D.C., as I always tell everybody. I went to the Tacoma Elementary School. I attended youth orchestra at Coolidge. I went to Gonzaga for high school, AU for undergrad, and law school at Howard University. Uh, I represent, I, I don't represent, I, I'm a member of DC Smart Meter Choice. And we are arguing that Pepco customers should have the choice to opt out of having a wireless radio frequency radiation emitting, emitting uh, meter on their house. I would like to uh, today ask for some additional funding for the Office of People's Council. Um, it, what, what I have noticed growing up here in Washington is that PEPCO seems to have a lot of friends all over the city and often gets what they want. But lately, um, some people have been concerned, and there's more and more of, I guess you could call it, a backlash against PEPCO. So a recent press release from the Office of People's Council sort of sums this up. Uh, People's Council calls PEPCO's rate case request insulting. What I would like to advocate for is some kind of a uh, additional amount of money that maybe could be tied to the CEO of PEPCO's salary. So we learned the other night I learned, uh, I went to the Federation of Citizens Association meeting where Chairman Kane from the Public Service Commission came, Ms. Fry, the, the head of the People's Council, and Thomas Graham, the head of, of DC PEPCO, not the head of PEPCO Holdings. But his boss, as, as he said, deserves $11.3 million. Okay, well, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but that's a huge increase from what he earned in 2011. I believe then it was maybe seven million. But maybe the Office of People's Council should have a, there should be a special fund that can be t tied into what the CEO of PEPCO makes. So as his salary goes up, maybe the Office of People's Council could get additional money. But a separate request that I have is, when we see PEPCO spending huge amounts of money, perhaps a million dollars, to advocate against a nominee to the Public Service Commission, and they, they hire, um, for example, they hired a, a emeritus judge, Stanley Sporkin, who I appeared before once. He is a wonderful guy, a great judge, and he did a report um, that some felt was used sort of in a heavy-handed way by PEPCO to keep one of the, to keep a nominee off of the Public Service Commission. So to, to sum up, I would, I would argue 
the Office of the People's Council should have some additional funds, maybe tiered to what the CEO of PEPCO is getting, and then in addition, maybe there can be an emergency fund so that when PEPCO hires retired federal judges or, or experts, the Office of People's Council also has the ability to hire another judge. You know, often when you hire somebody and tell them what you'd like them to report on, you can sort of steer the results of what it is that, that's being reported on. I'm not suggesting that anybody did that in this case. I'm just arguing it might be good to have two consultants commenting on a potential nominee rather than just the PEPCO one. And, and this also goes into this issue of, of smart meters. So when you call the Public Service Commission and ask for a meter test, you actually can't get a refereed meter test regarding the RF radiation that the smart meters are emitting. You can only get a meter test, a refereed meter test about the, you know, is your meter over billing you? And in my case and in some other people's cases around town, PEPCO sent their consultant, the Public Service Commission Consumer Affairs Department comes, they watch the consultant, but there's no independent uh, person there or, or test. So, and I'll talk about this when I testify later, but this is a very simple machine. It's $130. It's a tri-field machine, and it measures radio frequency radiation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, I do have one question. You, you said in your testimony that you think that the Office of People's Council should have additional funds, um, but you didn't speak to specifically. I, I think you mentioned hiring a judge, if, if PEPCO hires a judge. Um, but, but what specifically do you think the funds should be used for? I think that in the in, in the world of Washington, D.C., and in other cities, we, especially in Washington, we know that industry will often hire a consultant to, to present their point of view. And I feel that the Office of People's Council has a lot to say. Like, their press release, People's Council calls PEPCO rate case request insulting, March 8, 2013. I think they should be able to call on experts when they, if PEPCO is going to engage in the practice of hiring very well-known consultants. I mean, Judge Sporkin used to be at the Securities and Exchange Commission. He has an amazing reputation. And I think it would behoove the city and the customers to have an equally wonderful advocate on the side of the Office of People's Council. It, it's hard work. To, I mean, you you you're not only hiring a very well-respected judge, but you're in effect hiring his. Um, it, it's hard to explain, but the Office of People's Counsel, I think, needs more help, and they have a huge adversary, not just in Pepco, but in the other utilities that they okay. deal with. And I, I'm, sh I'll let, you know, uh, Miss Madabu Fry speak to it, but but I hope you aren't underestimating. Uh, the Office of People's Council and the staff. No, not at all. Okay. Not all right. Well, I appreciate your testimony, Mr. Turner. I don't have any additional questions for you at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call up the government witnesses at this point for the Office of People's Council. Good morning. And, and ask that you all, as you approach, before you uh, are seated, if you could, uh, whomever's going to testify, if you could raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. And Ms. Madabu Fry, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman McDuffie and staff. I am Sandra Madabu Fry, People's Counsel for the District of Columbia. Thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to appear before you today and to present the Office of People's Council's fiscal year 2014 budget request. 
Appearing with me today is Deputy People's Counsel Karen Sistrunk, as well as other senior members of my staff. Ms. Gurmeet Scoggins, OPC Agency Fiscal Officer from the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, is also here and available to provide specific details regarding OPC's FY 2014 proposed budget. Pursuant to the committee's request, OPC provided comprehensive responses to six questions. These responses provide the committee with the requested information regarding the office's budget. While OPC's budget is revenue neutral to the district's budget, as a steward of the public trust, I am fully committed to exercising fiscal constraint and accountability in the continued development and management of OPC's financial affairs. One of my first tasks as People's Council was to strengthen our financial management practices. My primary objective is, being to, is to ensure that funds requested and expended by OPC provide direct and tangible benefits to the consumers who ultimately pay the bills. OPC's FY 24 budget request is for $6,565,523. This represents an increase of $450,000 or 7.4 percent over the approved FY 2013 budget. The bulk of this increase is driven by two major factors. First, an increase in personnel services of $289,000 consisting of a two additional FTE positions and associated fringe benefits and an increase of 123000 for cost of living adjustment, bringing the agency's total FTE positions to 38.4. Second, an increase of $200,000 in contractual work associated with preliminary formal case proceedings. The cost and the new positions are directly linked to projected expenditures needed and necessary to support both our new energy efficiency sustainability unit and to add two utility engineers to our technical division. This complies with current statutory mandates which require OPC and the PSC to consider public safety, the economy, and the conservation of natural resources. In little over one and a half years of operation, OPC's Energy and Sustainability Unit has made great strides in representing the interest of D.C. consumers at both the federal and state levels and localizing the Im impact of energy efficiency to everyday consumers. I established this section to increase awareness of energy efficiency and renewable and sustainable options to the broad base of D.C. consumers in all wards and at all income levels. This multi-divisional section comprised of OPC litigation, technical and consumer education and outreach staff is active in our local communities and has played a major role in activities at FERC and PJM. The district is in the vanguard of energy efficiency and sustainability achievements and is emerging as a national leader in this area. Consistent with these broad objectives of the city, and new statutory mandates, OPC's ESC, ESS section has conducted over 135 energy efficiency workshops throughout the city, participates in federal proceedings through transmission and renewable issues, and has formed alliances with local environmental groups, as well as with proponents of solar energy as a supply source. OPC's efforts complement and support the city's ongoing energy efficiency initiatives, including the Sustainable Energy Utility and the Mayor's Sustainability Initiative, and I continue to serve on the 13-member SEU Advisory Board. The growth of the district's sustainability movement is anticipated to acquire awareness campaigns, public events, surveys, and reporting requir requirements that incur additional expenditures to continue delivering these to district residents. In addition, we fully anticipate that the frequency of utility rate filings will continue. 
just six months after PEPCO was awarded $24 million in, a, in its last rate case, it filed a new rate increase for an additional $52.1 million. Once again, OPC will be embroiled in litigation with PEPCO. We are also awaiting the PSC's decision with respect to the recently litigated $29.1 million Washington gas rate case. We continue to be proactive in other consumer-related issues. In response to complaints received from consumers, we petitioned the PSC for an investigation into alternative energy suppliers with particular focus on their customer solicitation practices. We have filed testimony and participated in the investigation into Verizon's quality of service. This does not include the open cases pending before the PSC, such as our filing, with, such as our filing of a petition with the PSC regarding the feasibility of providing a smart meter opt-out provision for electricity consumers and other emerging issues such as dynamic pricing, cyber security, and privacy. It is important and certainly cost effective for OPC in-house staff to participate in these cases. It is equally important that we pay parallel attention to the ongoing energy efficiency and sustainability issues that impact consumers. With the City's focus on power line undergrounding as a measure to address and ameliorate PEPCO's reliability performance, the office will hire two engineers to assist us in evaluating PEPCO's plans for infrastructure improvement, including undergrounding. OPC's total FY 2014 budget request is allocated as follows. For personal, our personal services allocation is $4,353,000. This reflects an increase of 289,000 or 7.1 percent increase over FY 2013 and primarily reflects the cost associated with our work to support the outcome of the Mayor's Task Force on Undergrounding. OPC received an additional two FTE positions, associated fringe benefits and a cost of living increase in the amount of $123,000. Our non-personnel service allocation is $2,213,000. This reflects a net increase of 161,000 or 7.8 percent increase over the FY 2013 budget. The non-personnel service budget has decreases in the amount of 87,000 for a revised rent projection and a reduction in other services and charges for $9,000. In addition, there were increases in the amount of $55,000 for fixed costs and $200,000 for increased contractual support related to the preparation of technical papers and analysis concerning national, local, environmental, demographic, and sustainability issues that will impact DC consumers. The net increase totals $161,000. I am honored to serve as People's Counsel. My agenda continues to be customer empowerment, affordability, reliability, and energy efficiency and sustainability. I am therefore acutely sensitive to any measure that puts financial pressure on consumers' pocketbooks. I am neither dismissive nor cavalier with respect to the economic realities that face our consumers. I would not request an increase in costs if I were not convinced that they will result in measurable, short and long-term benefits to my clients and your constituents. A rapidly changing utility industry and related advances in utility technology are a reality. Utility companies have a tremendous capacity to outfund and therefore outrun the advocate and the people. Consumers must be informed and educated about the changes that are occurring and presented with viable options that will put them in a position to make meaningful choices. It is estimated that over the past 35 years, OPC has saved district rate payers $543 million in electric rates, $150 million in natural gas rates, and $290 million in telephone rates. This calculates to a total of $983 million in savings below requested rate increases. Over the same timeline, absent OPC's advocacy, 
nearly $1 billion more would have been siphoned from district consumers. Using this metric, I would say that OPC has returned a stunning value for every ratepayer dollar budgeted. The past two years of transition and attrition in the managerial ranks of the office has crystallized for me the need to focus attention on the administrative and organizational structure of the office. I recently hired an experienced human resource manager to coordinate and implement all personnel matters as the office continues to grow. I have implemented extensive administrative and procurement reforms. To date, I have issued 13 revised or new administrative orders, including orders pertaining to ethics, EEO compliance, records retention, and procedures for utilizing certified and small business enterprises. I'm in the process of reviewing all administrative orders and practices to determine which need modification, revision, or new written procedures. <clears throat> I have developed spending plans for long-range procurement objectives, implemented a new contract management policy, and established a plan to move toward full compliance with the district's government's goal of fulfilling 100% of our agency's expendable budget through certified small business contractors. For FY 2012, I am proud to report the agency reached 86% of its goal in contracting with CSBE vendors. Administratively, I have taken steps to reassign tasks within the office to balance workflow. The office has just deployed new software that enables staff to safely and securely, cooperatively with one another and seamlessly share documents with remote users through our network. We anticipate savings through the elimination of copying functions, courier expenses, and man hours lost waiting to work. In order to maximize the benefit of this application, Ongoing training is required for our staff and for our computer networking professionals on how to use and maintain this important tool. Chairman McDuffie, as the utility continues to evolve and further segment itself, consumer-based issues will take new dimensions. OPC is poised to respond. We will stay the course and continue to represent consumers to the very best of our ability. OPC's fiscal year FY 2014 proposed budget will allow the office to fulfill its mission and meet all statutory mandates. Thank you for your time. Ms. Goggins and I are available to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Madabu Fry. I don't have very many questions for you, actually, but I, I – um, I have some prepared questions for you then. I noted a couple of questions that, that I arose by virtue of the testimony that you just gave. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to start by asking you, uh, within the, uh, the mayor's proposed budget uh, for your office, it's slated to receive an additional two FTEs, and you spoke a lot about those two engineers. I just wanted to make sure that, that those are the two that you're, that you're referencing. So it's the yes. engineers that would do some work that you touched on. If you could speak a little bit to what exactly you, your plans are for those two additional uh, engineers. Yes, certainly. Um, I anticipate that those two, the two engineers will be used if and when the um, Mayor's Task Force produces a report on the undergrounding study and that undergrounding is actually implemented. How, <coughs> excuse me, however, they will be instrumental in general because there will be infrastructure changes within the context even of raid cases and we don't presently have um, utility engineers on staff. We generally will have to retain them. So this will enhance the office's ability to look at those types of issues irrespective of whether the commission, either, irrespective of whether an actual undergrounding agenda is or initiative is takes place. But I'm very, I'm very, um, optimistic that there will be a report produced by the mayor's office and that there will be specific um, directions that will be taken and that we will need to look into. Any updates on, on when the 
report might be uh, forthcoming? I understand that it will be forthcoming very soon. Okay. Yeah, I think that's been uh, sort of uh, very I, soon has been the catchphrase uh, of the last It has. Uh, I months. saw the city administrator as I was coming in today. And he, he told you very me. soon. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> very soon. Okay. Um, I am cautiously optimistic that we will have a very good report in a very short time. My, my optimism is, is waning. Um, <laughs> As Have faith, Chairman I, I am excited, though. I, I look forward to reading it and, 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 and seeing the recommendations. As um, do we all. In advance of sort of the, the rain and the storms and, and things that I'm sure we'll see. Exactly. Uh, uh, that we saw last year with the derecho and, and the storm that preceded the derecho, we were hit pretty hard. That's right. Well, uh, I can Morefire. say that the committee and the members have been working assiduously to move the agenda forward. And I, again, I am cautiously optimistic that we will have something that we can all be proud of. Okay. I look forward to it. Um, th there was Mr. Turner who testified before you um, talked about the need to, to he, he suggested that you all needed additional funds, perhaps to hire a judge or some other uh, expert uh, in the field. And I was I sort of wondered whether or not he was underestimating you and your staff. Um, but I will note in your testimony, you said that utility companies have a tremendous capacity to outfund and thereby outrun the advocate and the people. Um, what are your thoughts on his suggestion specifically? In 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 how do you um, sort of grapple with the ability, as you articulated, of utility companies to outfund and outrun you all? Well, that's, you know, I certainly appreciate the sentiment um, undergirding Mr. Turner's comment. I mean, clearly, we always need more money, but there is a need to balance because every dollar that I get um, comes from ratepayers. And I don't want to put an unnecessary financial burden on consumers to carry out costs. Um, it is absolutely correct that the utilities have unlimited resources to uh, counter whatever the office does and whatever the Public Service Commission does. And quite frankly, I don't think there's enough money in the world to meet them dollar for dollar. So what my charge is and what my mandate is, is to do it as efficiently and effectively as I possibly can. Um, I, you know, my budget is premised on my belief that I can fulfill that mandate um, with the f amount of money that I've requested. One of the issues that we did raise, as you're aware of, is a, we filed a petition for the commission to look into executive compensation and tying that to reliability. That is one way of addressing the issue of consumers paying you know, these exorbitant prices for the salaries of executives and sort of mitigating the cost. So my response is we always appreciate and need money, but I do want to do it in a fiscally responsible way and to make certain that, and my charge again is to do my job as efficiently as, as possible. And I, and I appreciate uh, your efforts in that respect. Um, the increase of 200 in contractual work associated with uh, preliminary formal case proceedings, can you talk a little bit more about what that is and what that uh, is yes. for? Yes. <clears throat> we have, as you know, we have an assessment process whereby we can assess uh, the utilities through the utility consumers, through the utilities um, for our costs related to uh, ongoing cases. That is an extensive process that requires a number of um, steps to do. We have to first file with the utilities and then we get a response, we allow them to respond and then we file with the commission who approves the request. And that takes some time, usually maybe 30 days, 45 days from start to finish. Um, what happens is that in, the, in some instances, a, commit, a company will file a case on day one. And once that, that process goes through, it's day 45 before we actually get funded. Um, but the case itself is going on, and we frequently will need um, advice or expert assistance during that period before the actual assessment document is approved. What I would like is to have a fund 
that I can actually pay, um, use con on retained consultants that would be able to give us a preliminary advice with respect to those um, issues. So it sounds like what Mr. Turner was referring to almost, perhaps. Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Not giving him credit for what you want to do, but, but you know, he, he, he seemed to be suggesting that, um, you know, you, your work is informed by the, the expertise of outside consultants and that, you know, uh, you all would, you could use uh, additional funds to be able to do that, to hire people when you need them. So, mm -hmm. It's a timing issue for us primarily. Okay. All right. uh, can you explain uh, how the Office of Consumer Advocacy and Representation and Public Information Dissemination activities work? Oh uh, Yes. I'm very proud of the Consumer Outreach and Education Division. Um, they are very active in the community. They are really our face in the community. Uh, we have each uh, consumer service representative is assigned a ward or a district, and they are required to attend four um, outreach meetings per month. And they actually meet with the ANC commissioners as well as civic association commissions um, or any group that calls the office and would like to have a representative from the office come and speak. And when they go, they tell consumers about the ongoing issues that are before the commission, as well as whatever work OPC is working on. But one of the things that I really like about those sessions is, is, is that it gives the office an opportunity to hear directly from consumers. And many of the issues that we bring to the commission come from what we learn at those meetings. You know, for example, the alternative energy providers, we've heard from our community members that they were being solicited by these energy companies and that they were sometimes using unscrupulous practices. That's a direct result of our interaction with the community in the community. In addition, we have the energy, our EES section, who goes out and she does the energy workshops. She's done 135 uh, so far this year. So she's very active and she does a hands-on demonstration of energy efficiency measures that ordinary consumers can implement. In, in the area of contractual services other, mm -hmm. um, if you could explain the increase, which I believe is, is, is nearly 74%, what does that represent? Mm -hmm. That would include the 200000 that we talked about, okay. that we discussed. And that's all that represents? Yes. Okay. According to your key performance indicators, you indicate that you project to close 90% uh, of your consumer complaints. Yes. Uh, what strategies or programs do you have in place uh, to ensure that you meet this goal? Well, we have, we have a, a customer identification database, a CID um, software product, and we have constantly upgraded that to facilitate our ability to not only track consumers, but to follow through on their complaints. Um, to date, we have, com we have um, processed 1,400, close to 1,400 complaints and 404 inquiries. So we are definitely on pace to meeting that objective. And I actually only have uh, one additional question. In it relates to the occupancy fixed costs. Uh, can you explain the increased budget line for that? And I believe it's CSG 35. Um, yes, Ms. Scoggins will sure. address yes, that. Uh, as you know, the uh, building rent uh, is estimated by the Department of General Services. Is your mic on? Uh, yes, it is. 
The estimate for the building grant, um, OPC is in a rental uh, location, and the rent is estimated by the Department of General Services. Uh, the issue here is not the increase, but the allocation out of the rent line. When we look at the object class 32, which is a rental, there is a decrease of 87, but then there is an increase of 50, 55. So what it is is the money is allocated from one line to another. In the previous year, it was the 55 for uh, the occupancy was including in the rent line. They just separated and put it on two different lines. Okay. Explain the last part. You said they were separated and placed on two different lines previously. Uh, the last part of what you just said, I, I, I didn't hear what you said. Yes. Uh, what I said was that uh, the rent, the total rent we are looking for uh, here in the last last fiscal year, 2013, the total rent was one one million and thirty-one thousand dollars. Okay. And this year, the estimate for rent is nine forty-four reflected here. Mm -hmm. But last year, occupancy cost was included in the rent of gotcha. one million. Okay. So they just took that out of this year, took it out of the rent line, and put it on occupancy. And so net effect is an increase of thirty-two thousand dollars in for rent okay. for two thousand fourteen. Okay, I understand. Uh, I don't have any additional questions at this time. Is there anything else, uh, Ms. Uh, Madabu Frau, you'd like to add to the record before we conclude? <laughs> Um, no, we, uh, you know, OPC, as I said, will continue to represent consumers to the very best that of our ability. Uh, we believe, I know that there are new and emerging issues that are going, that we are all going to have to grapple with, and I'm looking forward to opening a dialogue both with your office as well as the other important stakeholders in the process. I appreciate your time. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, both of your testimony here this thank morning. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we're going to move on to the Public Service Commission. We've got uh, two public witnesses who have signed up to testify. It's Michael Syndrome and Chris Turner. If you all could come forward, please. I saw Mr. Syndrome earlier. I don't see him here. Uh, so we'll proceed with you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Council Member McDuffie. And thank you for allowing me to testify again. I'm here uh, as a member of DC Smart Meter Choice. We uh, believe that Pepco customers should have the right to opt out of the wireless smart meters that Pepco has installed in the last year, year to two years, as customers in many states around the country can, in Maine, Vermont, California, Michigan, Nevada, uh, and other jurisdictions. And, and tentatively, they can opt out in Maryland. My mother opted out. She lives in Montgomery County. Today, I would like to advocate or argue that um, as technology changes, the Public Service Commission needs more funds to keep up with technology and, and emerging technology. So I brought a few handouts that I'll quickly summarize. But first, I want to start with uh, an iPhone. Recently, it came to my attention when uh, a doctor testified before Yvette Alexander's committee, Council Member Alexander's committee, the Committee on Health, that there's a notice in your iPhone if you go to settings and general and uh, I guess other and then legal, there's a legal notice that advocates or seems to advocate that you should carry your cell phone 10 millimeters from your body or one centimeter, and that's an RF notice, a radio frequency notice, and you can go online and watch her interview from April 18th on, on local Fox News. So the argument is that there's more science and a growing awareness that maybe cell phones are a possible carcinogen that other sources of radio frequency may be. Like Wi-Fi, there, there now are people advocating not to put Wi-Fi in schools because it may be uh, a health 
concern or, or a, a negative health impact on the children. Um, to move along, the County of Santa Cruz, California Board of Supervisors, uh, last year had their uh, health agency issue a, a report called Health Risk Associated with Smart Meters, or that was the subject of the report. And in that report, they have a graph, which I'll turn into the committee, where a doctor argues that at three feet, a smart meter, which is always on, is over 40 times more powerful than a cell phone at three feet, adjusted for whole body average and things like that. Um, my other handout, another handout, recently our local CBS affiliate, USA 9, did a story on a bank of smart meters in a condo building on Connecticut Avenue where there are 32 meters. And they measured it with a radio frequency measuring device like, like I have, but a better one. And the story reads, frequency of smart meter emissions higher than PEPCO claims. And you can go online and Google that and find that. Um, recently in Maryland, a doctor, uh, David Carpenter, a public health physician who holds the positions of Director, Institute for Health and the Environment at the University at Albany, Professor of Environmental Health Services in the School of Public Health, submitted testimony to the Maryland Public Service Commission where he wrote about smart meters. My specific concerns about smart meters are as follows. Uh, the benefits of the smart meters are entirely to the utilities and is economic in nature. If they install smart meters, they can fire those individuals who at present are employed to go around reading the meters. Um, he goes on, wireless smart meters typically produce uh, atypical, relatively potent, and very short pulsed radio frequency microwaves whose biological effects have never been, been fully tested. They emit these millisecond long bursts on average 96,000 times a day with a maximum of 190,000 daily transmissions and a peak level emission two and a half times higher than the stated safety signals as acknowledged by Pacific Gas and Electric. And he says, I assume the specifics of the smart meters being installed in Maryland will be similar to those in California. We know that PEPCO is using some of the same meters in Maryland that they use here. Um, in, in, to, to, to sum up though, my argument is the Public Service Commission should have the technology. It may only be $300. My, my RF meter detector was 130, but maybe they should buy some $300 ones or $900 ones. And when you call for a meter test, you should not have the Public Service Commission recommending or sending PEPCO to test your meter, but you should have the Public Service Commission test it. So I think um, that some additional funding, even $1,000, would be helpful and a, and a smaller, uh, another small amount for the training of somebody. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Turner. And I'm, I'll make a note of, of the point you just made uh, and, and give Chairman uh, Betty A. Kane an opportunity to respond when she testifies. Also noting, though, that this, this obviously is a budget oversight hearing and not a performance oversight hearing, but I, I, I think you make an important point, so I'll give her an opportunity to respond. Thank you for your Thank testimony you. here this morning. Thank you. And we're going to move on to our government witnesses for the Public Service Commission. Uh, I see Chairman Betty Ann Kane is here. Is uh, Commissioner Fort going to testify as well? Okay. Oh. <laughs> just supporting you. Okay. <laughs> and our fiscal officer. All right. And if you all want to raise your right hands. You swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. And uh, good morning to each of you. And, and Chairman, you can begin wherever you're ready. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, uh, Chairman McDuffie. Um, and thank you very much for the chance to be here. Again, for the record, I'm Betty Ann Kane. I'm Chairman of the Public Service Commission. Um, and I'm pleased to prepare for you today to present testimony on the mayor's um, fiscal year 2014 budget request for the commission. <clears throat> As we noted, Commissioner Joanne Dottie Fort uh, is with us. Um, and then also on my left is uh, 
excuse me, Felicia Fontroy Bowman, our executive director, and uh, Gurmeet Scoggins, our agency fiscal officer, who was assigned to the commission. Uh, the commission has requested and the mayor has proposed for fiscal year 2014 a gross budget of $11,950,981 and 78.6 full-time equivalent positions. This represents an increase of $1,128,059 and six FTEs over the approved 2013 budget. The proposed 14, 14 budget, gross budget, includes no local funds, um, 11,611, 11 million, excuse me, $11,611,989 in O-type funds, uh, 318,992 in federal funds, and $20,000 in private donations. And I would note that 11611000 uh, in O-type funds is a reimbursement and assessment um, that is paid by 81 different utilities and service providers, utility service providers in the District of Columbia. Um, of the approximately um, um, 1.128 million increase between 2013 and 2014, 1.170 million is in personal services and that is offset by a decrease of 42,000 in non-personal services. The increase in personal services is attributed to the following. There's an increase in regular pay of $614,000, fringe benefit adjustments pursuant to the formula that all agencies are required to use of $240,000, and within grade incre adjustments that employees are entitled to of $51,000. And then district, the district government mandated cost of living COLA of $265,000. This is the 3% COLA um, that the mayor is proposing. The increases in personal services costs that are not associated with the COLA and step increases are due to the addition of these six positions. Two positions which were temporarily adding in 2013 and would be made permanent in 2014, and four new permanent positions in 2014. The two positions to be temporarily added in this fiscal year are a Chief of Compliance and Enforcement and Compliance Officer. The, new, the four new fiscal 2014 positions are a Gas Engineer, an Electrical Engineer, a General Engineer, and a Procurement Assistant. I'm restructuring the agency in 2014 and starting in 2013 in order to align and hence improve the Commission's compliance and enforcement, infrastructure and system planning, and procurement performance. More specifically, uh, the Commission is reorganizing our current Office of Engineering, which is within our Office of Technical and Regulatory Analysis, into two offices a new Office of Compliance and Enforcement whose function will be to monitor compliance and enforce, among other things, the service quality rules applicable to the electric, natural gas, and local telephone companies to ensure safe, quality, and reliable service, and an Office of Infrastructure and System Planning that will focus on planning and overseeing future infrastructure enhancements in all three industries regulated by the Commission. In fiscal 14, when it's fully staffed, the Office of Compliance and Enforcement will be composed of the chief position, two existing natural gas pipeline safety engineers, a compliance and enforcement officer, and an inspector who is being transferred from our Office of Consumer Services. An attorney from the Office of General Counsel will also be designated as the liaison to this office. Uh, as I indicated at a performance hearing, oversight hearing last month, the Commission included $200,000 in our FY13 budget to initiate this improved compliance function. And the Commission is using these funds to establish the first two positions in the new Office of Compliance this spring. The new Infrastructure and System Planning Office will contain the current Chief Engineer position, and a new gas engineer, electrical engineer, and a new general engineer. 
In addition then to the five new employees in these two offices, the Deputy Executive Director for Administrative man Matters, who serves as the procurement officer among other duties, is in need of a procurement assistant. Given the substantial increase in both administrative and formal case procurement activity, this assistant will help to ensure the timely processing of purchase orders and invoices, among other things. Uh, as I said, as, sure, as, as shown in Table DHO-1, special purpose revenue, or O-type revenue, when it's called in the budget system, remains the funding source for 97% of the fiscal 2014 budget, totaling $11.612 million. Pursuant to DC Official Code 34912, this revenue comes from assessments on PEPCO, Washington Gas, Verizon, and all competitive electric and natural gas suppliers and wireline telecommunications service providers who are licensed by the Commission in conducting business in the district. Over 81 different companies regulated by the Commission contributed to this source of funding for the Commission in fiscal 2012. The remaining approximately 319,000, or about 3% of the proposed 2014 budget, will be covered primarily by two federally funded grants, 274,000 from the U.S. Department of Transportation to support the Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Program, and 45,000 also from U.S. DOT for the One Call Grant Program. The Commission's other federal grant um, from the stimulus funds, which we have had for the last few fiscal years, ended uh, this month. The proposed fiscal 2014 budget will enable the Commission to continue to carry out its mission effectively and efficiently. Uh, Chairman Duffy, what, McDuffie, while I know this is not a performance oversight hearing, I wanted to take the opportunity um, to let you know that we did meet our key performance indicators for 2012 and expect to have this, with this budget, be able to meet all our indicators for 20, um, 2013 and 14. Um, we, uh, our budget uh, performance goal was to close, uh, adjudicate, or to, excuse me, to issue adjudicative case, case decisions within 90 days from the close of the record. And we did meet that goal for timely decision making by issuing our order in the last PEPCO rate case um, on September 27, 2013. Another performance goal was the number of hits to our website, which we have greatly improved and including in, uh, initiating a mobile app. We had over 1.34 million hits to our website in fiscal 2012. <clears throat> we tracked the cost of uh, handling informal consumer complaints. Our goal of our target was $67.84 and our actual cost in fiscal 12 was $67.98. Um, and then for our gas line pipeline safety program, which I mentioned is federally funded, um, <clears throat> our 2012 results won't be available from USDOT until September, um, and they have just started field inspections. Well, they will begin um, next week, and the audit will take place. But we will are proud to say that for 2012, we received a 97% rating uh, from the USDOT, and we do expect um, that we will be on track for that. Um, we acted on all licensing requests from competitive suppliers within 45 calendar days for electricity, 20 days for gas suppliers, and 15 days for telecommunications service providers. Um, we continued to engage a consultant and will carry into the 2014 budget a consultant that independently inspected more than 200 PEPCO manholes. All manholes where deficiencies were found were referred to PEPCO and the problems were resolved according to schedule. Um, we approved all telecommunications interconnection agreements within 11 calendar days. Actually, this federal statute mandate is 90 days. We did it within 11. And we participated in 112 community outreach events, 39 of which targeted the Spanish-speaking community. Um, and we um, expect, as I said, to meet our goals for 2013 and for 2014 as well, given the budget that we've requested. Um, we have pending cases of interest in formal case 1090 uh, on investigation of Verizon service reliability. Um, we continue to educate and will continue to educate the public about solar opportunities. Um, we just partnered with the Sustainable Energy Utility. I will continue to serve on the SEU Advisory Board. 
um, and with DDOE, we had two free Earth Day events at Union Station, um, at which I spoke, and we are continuing to provide information on energy efficiency and on solar opportunities to the public. And finally, as you know, uh, the Commission held a Centennial Anniversary Symposium on March 15th at the Kellogg Conference Center at Gallaudet University. We had a turnout of 235 attendees, and I want to take the opportunity to thank you and the Council for the resolution recognizing our significant achievement of 100 years um, as the Commission and the proceeding, and thank you personally for your attendance and participation in the event. Um, we are going to post all the proceedings from the symposium on our website um, so that people can, and we hope to have that done by the end of the month. And we have some other additional things planned for the rest of the year. Um, also, just to indicate that um, our standard offer service rates that go into effect on June 1st for uh, default uh, supply for people who have not chosen um, a competitor uh, of, of, of for electricity supply, that will go up just slightly from 8.4 cents per kilowatt to 8.8 .8 cents for summer and 8.7 cents uh, for the winter. Um, and as you are aware, all electric customers can choose their electric generation supplier um, while Pepco remains the sole delivery company. Um, and over the past year, I'm happy to report that the number of retail suppliers who are accepting new residential customers has increased from 7 to 10, so customers have even more choices. Um, and that contributed to an increase in the percentage of residential customers who have chosen a supplier from 9% to 15%. Um, retail choice among commercial customers has remained steady at about 34% of the customers, but about 85% of the actual electricity use for commercial customers uh, is are with people who have not stayed with the default service. And all of that information um, is on the website. Um, let me update on a couple of other matters that I think you're going to ask some questions about and there's strong public, in public interest. In response to a request from the Council, the Commission has engaged independent experts to study and report on a number of questions related to the installation and use of advanced metering infrastructure for electric distribution customers, um, and that installation was authorized by the Council. Uh, we expect to have preliminary reports from one consultant next month and the other in a few months after that, um, and we certainly will, when that's final, uh, communicate those results to the Council as requested. Um, with respect to telecommunications matters, um, we issued an order, as I said, opening an investigation to a billing order um, at Verizon involving the imposition of a federal subscriber line charge and a federal access recovery charge on low-income lifeline customers. Um, and uh, we are also in a proceeding at the FCC about the, um, the ARC charge, um, which is not supposed to be imposed on lifeline low-income customers. And Verizon discovered this error as a follow-up to several complaints through our consumer complaint mediation process, and we are now opening an investigation into that because there seems to have been a pattern. And finally, the <coughs> Washington gas case, um, 1093, which is before the Commission, we will be issuing a decision on that next month. Um, it's finally on some legislation, just briefly, um, in terms of the Budget Support Act. We are again requesting that the Council Act two pieces. Uh, the most important is an amendment to the District's uh, Freedom of Information Law, <clears throat> which would protect critical infrastructure information from inappropriate disclosure. And the other is a technical amendment that um, DCHR uh, is working with us on in terms of the reference for how you set commissioners' compensation. We submitted the FOIA amendment and a hearing was held last July um, before another committee. As cybersecurity becomes an increasing concern for utilities and regulatory commissions across the country, we're again asking that language that parallels the federal protection for critical infrastructure information be added to the D.C. Code. Um, that concludes my testimony on the 2014 budget, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Kane. I guess the benefit of serving on the council for as long as you did is you, you learned to anticipate questions that we yes. want to ask from this uh, <laughs> position because you answered a number of the questions that I had planned to ask about uh, the timing of some of the decisions and when they were going to yes. be rendered, uh, as well as um, the, the uh, concerns raised around the advanced media and infrastructure. 
and the uh, reports that you all have, have, have commissioned. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear that and that those uh, are going to be, at least one of them uh, is going to be expected in May. Uh, and so that's, that's good news. One of the things that I did want to ask about some of the, uh, the FTEs, I had a question that I wanted to ask about the six FTEs, which you also answered in your testimony, but um, I, I think I still understand that there's several vacancies that are listed uh, for fiscal year 13, and, and now that we're in the third quarter, uh, I wonder of how not filing those, filling those vacancies has impacted the operations of the, the PSC, uh, and what uh, is the plan uh, moving forward, at least as it relates to this fiscal year, to fill or not those positions that are yep. vacant. Thank you. I'd be happy to update you on that. First of all, the first three vacancies that are listed, uh, the commissioner, technical advisory, advisor to the commissioner, and executive assistant to the commissioner, um, those are not vacancies at the moment that, that we can fill. Uh, we are awaiting um, a nomination um, and I'm to go through the council for a commissioner. So then the technical advisor and the executive assistant, those are positions that the new commissioner would fill. Um, so those are just vacant until a new commissioner is, is confirmed. Um, in terms of the um, office um, of the um, attorney general, um, actually um, I think probably what was sent over to you for attorney advisor, uh, position number um, 22027, um, we have filled that position. Um, with uh, and the candidate um, started on uh, yes uh, Monday uh, Monday of this week. Okay. Um, we filled that position um, from within uh, with an attorney who was actually an attorney, but who was in a position of legal assistant. So he moved up starting Monday into that position of legal assistant, and um, uh, excuse me, he, I mean he was in the law clerk position. That's uh, so law clerk position. Um, and he moved uh, up into that um, position. Can I, can I and tell so you? that was vacated on Monday. Okay. And so that's, we, we try to hire from within. When we, I, I put a lot of effort into training and staff development. So um, when we have an employee, although we competed uh, with the outside, um, we did feel that um, the law clerk moved into the um, attorney advisor position. So we have, um, uh, looking at, uh, making that position which was our funded permanent and on the other attorney advisor position um, we got 38 applications for it that has been advertised um, the cl uh, advertising closed on um, May, uh, April 12th um, and we anticipate uh, completing the rating and ranking uh, process uh, by the uh, tomorrow or, and completing the selection certificate by next week so that will take care and fill up our um, uh, office of attorney general um, the regulatory docket manager position, um, we did, um, again, that was uh, vacated because we moved the person in that position became our new secretary, um, and we decided to make a revision to that uh, position description. It was a little slow with DCHR, um, but we have advertised that position, and that uh, announcement closed in January, and we are looking at uh, the responses that we got. We may need to advertise that again with a, um, instead of a 13, making it a 12, 13, because we didn't get for that specialized position what we needed. Um, in the pipeline safety <coughs> engineer, our pipeline safety engineer just left um, on uh, March 25th. And so we reclassified that position and we are uh, going to have a vacancy announcement out next week on that. Um, that was again somebody we brought up through the ranks. Uh, he came um, to do the pipeline safety engineer positions because they're funded by federal DOT. Mm -hmm. There's a whole series of about two years of training courses that a person needs to take. Um, and wonderful person we had there as soon as he finished that, uh, US DOT hired him. <laughs> <laughs> but he just left last month for $20,000 for $20, more, yes, <laughs> we could afford. Um, so w that was, that's was been vacant less than 30 days. Um, and then the other two are um, new positions, um, the Chief Compliance Enforcement, Chief of Compliance Enforcement and the Compliance Enforcement Officer. We have put those vacancy announcements out a week ago, um, and we do hope we will be able to fill those quickly. We're using the $200,000 that was in NPS for we Originally, we were going to hire a consultant to help us figure out what to do, and I think, as I said, at a performance hearing, we, we, we decided we knew what we wanted to do. So we're, we reprogrammed that. And then the um, supervisory uh, 
consumer specialist, again, only became vacant on March 25th. Um, again, we hired from within. Um, we are changing the uh, description of that position to an education and outreach specialist, and I hope within the next 30 days we'll be able to have that hit the street. And then finally, the consumer specialist, which is really not a vacant position, the person who had been executive assistant to our third commissioner position um, has been detailed to, to that office pending a decision on a new commissioner. So I think there's really only one position that's been vacant for any more than about 30 days. Okay. And, and we're did, moving did, quickly. Did you mention um, the senior uh, economist tech advisor? That is the technical advisor to the okay. commissioner. Gotcha. To, to the vacant commission position. Yeah. Okay, thank you. This is, I would say, a significant improvement to it in terms of the number of vacancies. We, we, we have just the two um, that are 30 days old. Okay, okay. And you mentioned in your testimony, I had a question that I wanted to talk about the federal grants. Yes. Because uh, it looks like they decreased by approximately 31 percent. You yes. mentioned in your testimony that um, the, it was the ARRA stimulus funds. Yes. Um, are no longer going to be available. Uh, is that the only federal grant that you won't have? Uh, that is in? correct. And does that yes. the, represent the, the, the entirety of the 31 percent? That represents the entire reduction, okay. yes. It's um, I recently uh, come, come to my attention that the, the PSC is looking to find new office space, and I was hoping you can explain the criteria the commission has uh, with respect to finding a suitable location. Certainly. Um, our current lease um, expires November 30th of this year, of 2013. Um, we had a 10-year lease, and then when that lease was up, um, we had actually wanted for a good price to be able to extend it for 10 years. Um, what was then the Office of Property Management um, only permitted us to do a five-year extension. Um, and so uh, we've done s several things. Um, we hired a space planner um, to look at um, our current operations, um, a space and program planner to, to look at who, how people work, who needs to be next to each other, what kind of space do we need. Um, we are currently on three different floors. Um, we have uh, secretary uh, in two towers in one build in, in one building, but it's got two towers. So our secretary's office is on the second floor, the west tower, um, and then the rest of the commission staff is in the east tower on half of the sixth floor and all of the seventh floor, um, and that makes it some difficult. People have to work together. So one of the recommendations of our space planner was if we could have everybody all on one floor, it would be more efficient and interaction um, would, would work better. Um, so after we did the space planner, then we went to Department of General Services, which as you know handles um, space and leases for all district agencies, including including us. Um, this we, They worked up a statement of work um, based on the results of our space planning and the results of conversations with me and other uh, top officials at the commission in terms of what location our commuting patterns of our employees and most important um, being near the utilities that we regulate and also being uh, convenient for the public. Um, we are now very close to both Metro Center and the um, Farragut, uh, excuse me, McPherson Square, mm -hmm. um, so that we have the easy access for the red line, the green line, red line, the uh, blue and the orange line. And we wanted to stay in that general area for the convenience of the public. Um, the um, uh, Department of General Services um, completed the statement of work. They issued a, um, uh, they then issued a, uh, what they call a request for space, mm -hmm. um, and that is on the street. I believe results are due or responses are due May 17th, um, and then we will work with General Services to evaluate the, um, evaluate the, the responses and see what we can find that will meet our needs. We have, one of the things that our space planners found is that we really, have a very inefficient use of the kind of space we have now. Um, we have 30,000 square feet. In the middle, you'll see when you come over to visit us, um, in the middle of the sixth floor, there's, there's 
a big hole in a sense because the previous tenants, the middle of seventh floor, excuse me, the previous tenants on the sixth floor had a two-story sort of atrium. Mm -hmm. So we have on our seventh floor like a, a big O shape with a big hole in the middle, but we're paying for that airspace. Mm -hmm. um, and so although we have 30,000 square feet, even with our n six new employees coming in next year, we do not need more than we have now. So they're looking, for, first of all, for between 25 to 30,000 square feet. Um, we have a special need in terms of our hearing room so that we can have good sight visibility, a large hearing room without pillars in the middle. Um, and then our secretary's office has um, a, a large number of documents filed there with a document retrieval system on, on sliding things as sometimes you see in law libraries, medical offices. So there's some special physical needs for that. But we did work with Department of General Services in terms of specifications. And, and, we'll and, and do you all expect the rental rates to remain about the same? Or we go do. Up or? We do. We're paying about $54 a square foot now, and the range in the area that we're looking at runs anywhere from 40 to about 65 So um, we have not requested an increase. Matter of fact, you'll see there's a decrease um, mm -hmm. for, for rent next year. We hope um, that we will get um, a, a good building that meets our needs. Uh, we certainly have not ruled out in our current building is, is able to compete and make, put a proposal there. Um, but we would like to have a, a building that, that works and space that works um, is convenient and conducive to efficient, um, efficient uh, working of our staff. Okay. And if you could, please uh, uh, talk a little bit about the work that the utility regulation group provides. Well, actually, um, everybody except our consumer services is involved in utility regulation. Okay. Um, and uh, whether it's the commissioners who make the final decisions on, on most things, um, you know, down to our economists. Uh, we have economists, accountants, um, a, uh, engineers, uh, and uh, attorneys. And all of those folks are involved um, in our primary mission, which is regulation of utilities in, in the public interest. And, and also, I mentioned during Mr. Turner's testimony about uh, the PSC, he, he suggested that if a person calls PSC to, to, to uh, raise concerns about smart meters, yes. that uh, you all shouldn't send PEPCO out to test the meters, that you all should have somebody on, on to test the meters. What's we, your response we, to that? We send um, with, uh, we don't just send PEPCO out. When, when a, uh, an employee makes a complaint um, and the meter needs to be tested, we send someone from our consumer services office uh, to go. Uh, we then have the engineer from PEPCO go and do the testing. But we observe that testing, so it is not done, and then we, you know, remotely, um, we do participate in that. Um, in the, um, the consultant that we have uh, doing part of the work for the responses to the questions that the council raised, um, has also gone out and done testing with our staff uh, in the last uh, week and, and, and also we'll be doing next week on selected meters doing field testing, random testing. Um, and so they are the experts, but we, our staff will go with them on that. In terms of uh, them being the experts, is, is that generally uh, the, the generally accepted practice that although you have an engineer from PSC that accompanies that that engineer wouldn't have the expertise? Do they lack the expertise to perform the test themselves or uh, what question, sort of goes it's, into that? It's our consumer services folks who, who do that now. Um, but it's certainly possible with the new um, office, uh, the two new offices that, that we're creating with this Office of Compliance and Enforcement um, that we could do some more inspecting, um, as you say, ourselves with that, with that capability. Um, but I think we would always want to have the company there also um, so that there's everybody's observing the same thing sure. at the same time sure. and looking at the actual reading that occurs and everybody can see on site with the customer there too, the customer is there, so that th th there's no question about what the results say. Sure. Have there been any uh, sort of changes to federal laws uh, uh, that might impact uh, the PSC's operations? Uh, there was a significant change at the Federal Communications Commission in terms of the uh, requirements um, on uh, telephone companies that provide the low-income discount programs mm -hmm. on the um, kind of certification that they have to give um, and that they have to get from, from, the, um, from the state or from the commission um, in terms of eligibility. 
um, and we are working with DDOE, which currently administers that enrollment and eligibility determination program for telephone as well as gas and electric, um, to be sure that um, Verizon, which is our uh, the uh, wireline. Um, low-income provider um, is complying with those new requirements. It has made some changes in our procedures, um, but it hasn't had a budget impact um, on us. Um, the federal USDOT um, is contemplating some increased requirements for pipeline safety um, in order to qualify for the grants. Um, and we've been following those, um, but we don't expect any difficulty in meeting those new requirements. Okay. Um, and, and before I close out, I just want to see if you if you would agree that uh, the the task force on undergrounding uh, report uh, should be forthcoming very soon. I do expect it um, to be forthcoming. Um, the task force has been working in with the committee structure. There's a technical committee. We, they have done um, uh, very uh, extensive work, and it's been reported to the task force. Um, there's been a legislative committee and a finance committee, which I've been uh, very involved with. Uh, and I do believe that um, there will be, uh, and I think some good recommendations. Um, the task force was set up so that D DC DOD and Public Works and some of the other agencies have also been involved. Um, and so I think, uh, and so looking at issues of coordination, I would expect, um, from what I understand from the city administrator, that there will be a meeting fairly soon and there will be a report coming, uh, both recommendations to the mayor, um, which will probably include recommendations for legislation also. Okay. I look forward to it. I, I don't have any additional questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to offer for the record at this point? No, thank you very much. We look forward to, to working with you and just to remind the public that uh, there's very extensive information on our website, both about all our hearings and our matters. Almost everything that is filed with us uh, is is public, um, and consumers can also find their information about the choices that they have uh, for the various uh, suppliers for electricity and for gas. Uh, they are legitimate suppliers. They're licensed by us, um, and we're certainly available to handle any concerns or complaints that people have. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, your testimony here this morning. Thank you very much.
Uh, now we're going to be uh, considering the fiscal year 2014 budget request of the Office of Partnership and Grant Services. Uh, the office is the only entity uh, that has the authority to solicit, review, receive, and approve donations to the District of Columbia government. The office oversees the planning and execution of competitive grant funding requests from the district agencies to federal, found to federal foundation and private sector grantors. The office also provides capacity building training and technical assistance to district agencies and nonprofits. Finally, the office facilitates the establishment of collaborative philanthropic relationships or partnerships with private, public, nonprofit, and individual donors. The office is funded by an annual budget allocation, and the FY14 operating budget request is approximately $336,000, an increase of approximately $5,000. In addition, the office is not requesting an increase in FTEs and intends to execute its mission in FY14 with three FTEs. And now we're going to hear from our public witnesses first. Uh, before we hear from our government witness, who's the director of the office, uh, Mr. Lafayette Barnes. I'm going to call up the, uh, the first panel of public witnesses, Dr. Noura Green. Rosalind Parker, Kathy DeBeau, is Michael Syndrome here, Judy Smith, I'm going to begin from my left uh, and your right with uh, Ms. Parker. Good to see you. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman McDuffie, for this opportunity to, uh, to uh, testify in front of you. As President and CEO of Bridging Resources and Communities, Brick Inc., I, ha I am glad to have this opportunity today to officially state our support for fully funding the Office of Partnerships and Grant Services, OPGS, in order to preserve the capacity building funding alerts and related resources heavily relied upon by DC nonprofit organizations like ours which ultimately directly benefits the residents of the District of Columbia as well as the DC government itself. OPGS is truly a unique asset of the DC government that deserves to be maintained and fully supported. As I talk with other nonprofit executives in Maryland and Virginia as well as other parts of the country I have yet to find any other state or locality that has office similar to OPGS. That is one dedicated to the development and sustainability of nonprofit organizations, period. While my organization participated in OPGS's Strengthening Partners Initiative program in 2008-2009, my colleagues in Maryland and Virginia and elsewhere were truly envious of our ability to have access to such a critical year-long capacity building program dedicated to our unique development and sustainability needs at no cost to our organization. In fact, I have been asked on numerous occasions for the contact information for OPGS by non-DC nonprofit executives so they could learn more in an effort to approach their state or local government about establishing a similar office. OPGS is truly one of the crown jewels of the DC government a true best practices model that should be emulated and duplicated. While we can all appreciate in these continuing tough economic times, funding shortfalls and budget cuts are a reality, I hope that the DC Council under your leadership can find a way to face this reality and at the same time maintain successful stellar government operations like OPGS. I can honestly say that all of my SBI classmates are running nonprofit organizations that are now thriving and our respective successes are due in large part directly to the critical support we got both from our participation in the SBI program and that we still receive as SBI alumni. We are able to apply what we've learned from our SBI training sessions to successfully secure and maintain DC and federal government funding to select qualified staff and develop engaged board members who work together and support the mission and goals of our respective organizations along with learning how to assess our overall organizational structure, 
resource needs, including even how to get rid of staff on our board members when, it's, when they're holding us back. These are just a couple of tangible examples. In addition, the SBI Alumni Network is strong, very strong. We continue to collaborate and support each other on a regular basis. Especially in these con continuing challenging economic times, smaller nonprofit organizations need the full range of services offered by OPGS in order to be able to effectively compete for limited grant funding and contract funding opportunities such as the mayor's recently announced One City Fund, an excellent and innovative idea to help sustain DC's viable nonprofit community while offering critical services to DC residents. A viable and thriving Office of Partnerships and Grant Services not only benefits the numerous DC nonprofit organizations that rely on OPGS's capacity building resources, but also benefits the residents of the District of Columbia who rely on the essential services provided by our nonprofit organizations. Given the increased demand on our services by DC residents, the residents served benefit by the DC government because we work in partnership with you. So DC government agencies can't meet the increased demand for our services on their own. They don't have the manpower or the funding streams to do this without us, your community partners. And OPGS is the key to our success, so please help us continue to help you. As you mentioned in your opening, OPGS provides a range of critical services often for free or for very significantly discounted costs to those of us in the nonprofit community. That includes the Grants Information Resource Center, the weekly funding alert newsletter, numerous citywide workshops and conferences, their signature annual public-private partners conference, which is truly a phenomenal event, day-long opportunity to not only network with other nonprofits, executives but also to interact with federal and DC government individuals and learn of various resources that benefit our success. So in short, we hope that um, and are glad to hear of their increase for funding because as you probably know, they, this office has already experienced very significant budget and staffing cuts over recent years and so we truly hope that this trend will not continue. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for your, your time. testimony, Ms. Parker. Did, do you have any copies of your written testimony that you can provide to the committee? I emailed it. Okay. I didn't bring um, okay. printed copies. I just want to make sure because I, I was going to, I like to, to read the testimony. Oh, I'm testimony. sorry. I did email no, it no, a couple days ago. There's no ago. need to apologize. I, I yeah. just want to check. Trying to go green. You know, I didn't bring, and, I didn't and, bring and, the paper. And that is, that's all uh, uh, fine. And so uh, I want to move on to our next uh, witness, uh, Mr. Bo. Yes. Uh, and I do have a copy of your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, Councilman McDuffie and staff. My name is Kathy DeBow. I'm a lifelong resident of the District of Columbia, a retiree from the International Monetary Fund where I manage community outreach and grant programs, and currently I'm a volunteer working in the Office of Partnerships and Grant Services for the past six years. I'm here to testify about the importance of capacity building for nonprofits. Uh, we all know that uh, urban cities cannot exist without the help of nonprofits. They provide services that help the government care for its most vulnerable populations. They are our partners and in many cases our salvation in addressing the most critical and urgent needs of our city. There are about 27,000 district-based nonprofit registered with IRS of which about 10,000 are community-based charities with 501c3 or tax-exempt status. And this does not even include the thousands of district, faith-based, and other community-based organizations that don't have their 501c3 status. Our office was effectively shut down and merged into DSLBD in October of 2010, and staff was reduced from 10 to 3 people. At that time, most of our programs for capacity building for nonprofits, except for the funding alert, came to a halt. We no longer had resources to continue OPGS's popular year-long capacity building program for emerging district nonprofits that was started in 2003 and offered for 10 consecutive years. Fortunately, Mayor Gray resurrected our office in March 2011 because he understands the value of nonprofits and the importance of equipping our nonprofits with tools to succeed. 
OPS's Director Lafayette Barn and the Deputy Director Pat Henry have done heroic jobs of offering quality capacity building programs and services to our nonprofits, community, and faith-based institution with, without cost to the participants. They have found creative partnerships and ways to harness volunteers to provide pro bono services. But without adequate resources, our office cannot provide the many services needed by our constituents. For example, we get one to two calls daily asking for help in writing grants. We were fortunate to get a Howard University professor to provide two 10-week grant writing classes free of charge during the summers of 2011 and 2012. But that was basically a donation and not a service that we can depend on on the coming years. In fact, I've submitted testimony from Commissioner Keith Silver, who submitted uh, his reflections of the course that we offered. Uh, since our office cannot meet the demand for all services, we send our constituents to the Foundation Center for instruction in grant writing and other capacity building courses like budgeting, human resources, board development, marketing skill, etc. Your OPGS used to provide full day instruction for most courses and the foundation just offers an overview and their, more, their full day courses are around uh, $200. Since I only have 16 seconds left, I just wanted to end by saying that uh, the men and women of our DC nonprofits are our soldiers fighting the war on poverty and promoting self-sufficiency to avoid reliance on public service. As on-the-ground organizations, they are able to deliver services in a more targeted, cost-effective way than if the district government were to have to provide these services. They need our support to provide them with the tools they need to complete this mission. So as a uh, volunteer insider, I know that additional resources to provide timely and relevant training, literature, and paid personnel will make our nonprofit stronger and more effective. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Bow. Uh, Ms. Smith? Yes, hi. Commissioner McGovern. Is your mic on, uh, Ms. Smith? Press the button in front of you. You should see a green light come on. Okay. Yes, Commissioner McGuffey, thank you so much for having me here this morning. And um, I attempted to email this morning, but unfortunately in Ward 5, the cable service is in and out. <laughs> so I did not have internet service this all, morning. All cable service or a particular did, provider? No, no, to the whole, oh, okay. I, I don't know. If you got a lot of trees in Ward 5, so sometimes you, you get yeah, some spotty service, yeah. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> My service is pretty pretty solid, but uh -huh. uh, I understand. <laughs> it's fine. You can go ahead. And if you want to provide any type of written testimony to the, to the committee, you can feel free to do so. It's going to be open. The record's going to be open for uh, for 15 days. Oh, okay. Great. All right. Okay. Please continue. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, the Office of Partnership and Grants has been extremely instrumental for us, the, our organization. And I know a lot of organizations that I've partnered with have felt the same way. Um, I am, I participate in the Strengthening Partner Initiative in 2005. Um, and I don't know of no other service. And I'm serious in as far as in this area that provides and does what OPGS does. They're the hub for all district government grants that come through. We would not, <laughs> I don't know any other way of finding out about the grants except through this office. And I mean, I've attempted to go on and find other services. There's nothing out there without a cost. There's only one other that I know of. And um, the district has been allowed us, because this, the grants are out there, we've been able to apply for them. And within a 10 year period, we've had about seven grants and this is as a result of OPGS is putting it out there for us. Um, I've also participated in the grant writing courses, which have been extremely, whew, and they were things that I absolutely needed to do. To, and I've seen us grow over the years. Um, we've been around since 2003. So the services that we provide have made an impact in the city and we can clearly see that. 
Um, I think Lafayette Bonds and Pat, especially Pat, with all of, she puts out, out the workshops. And I don't think I would have experienced all that I have if it had not been for them, the whole office. Mr. Bo has been really instrumental with the GERD and sitting down at the one-on-one, -on -one, um, going through doing the grant search, finding out where the funding is going, has been extremely helpful to our organization. Um, I think the impact across the city from every organization I've talked to, we have a lot of gratitude that they're here. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Smith. I just have a couple of questions. I, I know that uh, at least a couple of you mentioned the uh, the funding alerts in your testimony, which which I imagine are, are very important. I know that a lot of uh, CBEs depend on alerts from DSLBD or, or, or other government agencies when they want to compete for opportunities uh, in the city. Uh, and have you found those funding alerts to be pretty reliable in terms of when you get them and the, the timeliness of them? Oh, e essentially so. I mean, they come out weekly, so that's very timely. And unlike, um, as you know, I mean, we can get information overload on the Internet. The beauty of the funding alert is that in one place you have information on D.C. funding opportunities. You have links to even the contracting opportunities in addition to the grant opportunities for the different agencies. And it takes you right into the clearinghouse, so it plugs you right into what you're looking for. You can search it by term. And also, you get connected to um, private foundation resources and other things all in one place. So that's the beauty of it. I mean, there's a lot of alerts I get, quite frankly, that I don't read as regularly as I should. But I do take the time to read that on a weekly basis because it is so um, fulfilled with so much useful information. And not only on funding, but different trainings that are coming up, um, a lot of them out of this office, but also through other offices. And to be able to get that kind of information for free, um, I mean, words cannot express. The, it's just such a time-saving measure to have all that in one place. I had an opportunity to, to, to visit uh, the office a couple of years ago and, and just sort of observe uh, one of the presentations they gave on grant opportunities and I found out about the resource center and it just sounded like something that would be extremely helpful but I also wondered uh, how many people uh, actually used it in, in, as a regular resource. Have any of you, uh, I know you're a volunteer Mr. Bo, but have any of you, uh, Ms. Smith or Ms. Parker ever used the resource center? Well that's yeah. what she was talking about when she said the GERC, that's the research okay. center. Gotcha. Yeah, and I have used it. Okay, okay. And how has it been helpful to you? It's allowed me to see where the funding, there's a way that funding comes into the city and where it goes. Mm -hmm. Like if for this, my program for obesity prevention, mm -hmm. we, had to, we did sit down and they took the time to sit down with me mm -hmm. and go through and find out where that funding, who was giving the money in this city mm -hmm. for that activity. Yeah. So that was extremely helpful. You want to ask I'm, them, Mr. Yeah, I'm in charge of the uh, Grant Information Resource Center. We have three databases that we purchased, the Foundation Center, which gives uh, grant opportunities across the country that can come to the district. Um, we have the Celebrity Foundation. We have something called Grants Direct. Plus, we have other resources. And I tell people all the time, there's no such thing as one-stop shopping. So we try to gather as much as we can so when our customers come, we can just provide them with an array of choices uh, that they can find funding. So. Well, that sounds great. I know uh, we have uh, other witnesses who are here who want to testify. So at this point, I don't have any additional questions for this panel. But I do appreciate you all coming down, taking the time out of your schedules, which I'm sure are pretty busy uh, uh, running organizations, to come down and, and testify. Thank and you. And, Mr. Chairman, it's nothing against the Foundation Center, but the, the bottom line is cost. I mean, to emphasize that they're able to provide this service to us, especially smaller nonprofits, for free. Most of their sure. services are free. So some of the conferences they also have to charge for. But even those rates for like day-long conferences, you know, what they charge us is so small that, I mean, that is really the uniqueness because, you know, you could argue that there are other nonprofit resources out there, but there are fees attached to those services. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing to really emphasize that makes them very special No, that's a good point. I appreciate you making that point. Uh, thank you all and, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, I'm going to call Core Masters Barry, Aretha Lyles. Are you not on this panel, Ms. Barry? I'm not on that yet. 
I'm sorry? I'm Okay. Gotcha. Uh, Chris Bryant. Is Chris Bryant here? Aretha Lyles is not here either. Is Diane Ty? Please come forward. One more call for Dr. Nora Green. Michael Syndrome. Are there any additional witnesses who have not signed up to testify who would like to testify? And if you could, uh, we're going to start uh, from my left with you, Ms. Ty. If you each could just make sure when you testify that the uh, green light in front of you on the mic is on and that you state your name for the record. And you can begin whenever you're ready, Ms. Ty. Sure. Good morning, uh, Chairman McDuffie, Council members, staff, and interested participants. Uh, my name is Dawn Diane Tai, President of a Allies Building Community, ABC, a 501c3 nonprofit and civic organization serving Washington, D.C. for many decades. We are happy to provide testimony appreciating the great work and significant impact of the D.C. Office of Partnership and Grants Services. Since 2002, members of ABC and I have participated in many of the OPGS programs, including the Strategic Partnership Initiative, SPI program, the annual public-private partnerships conferences, the Grants Information Resource Center, the Funding Alert, Grants Writing Classes, Capacity Building Trainings, Grants and Resource Development Support Programs. Mr. Lafayette Barnes and Pat Henry have provided truly inspirational leadership resources, workshops, meetings, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, resource development, and training sessions that small nonprofits could never have been able to afford. Since 2001, over 10,000 nonprofits and faith-based organizations have been touched by their dedication and compassion for the nonprofit and faith-based community. The Funding Alert has over 5,000 subscribers who read the e-newsletter every week to find funding, resources, and opportunities. As SPI participants, we had the opportunity to observe and learn from Ms. Henry's excellence in creating and managing training and executive leadership programs. Ms. Henry's skill in selecting and arranging for outstanding consultants, mentors, and her caring for her participants and students have helped to achieve successful overall outcomes. OPGS introductions, continuing guidance, and support for community leaders inspire them to continue to do more for DC residents. OPGD's training, capacity building support have helped our nonprofit to better serve our constituents in the areas of job readiness, job retention, economic opportunities, mental health, personal growth, prevention, and quality of life. OPGS training programs play a vital role in helping small nonprofits understand the legal context the expectations, responsibilities, requirements, and the grant application process of DC government. OPGS programs have strengthened our organization and have enabled our nonprofit to better serve DC residents and change lives. In appreciation, the Friendship Archway community presented 2012 Friendship Archway Awards to three key leaders of OPGS. These awards are posted at the Archway2.org website tab awards. Public Service Award to Lafayette Barnes in recognition of his outstanding leadership as director of the DC Office of Partnership and Grant Services. 
Under his guidance, there have been significant contributions. These include the continuation of the Funding Alerts, Grants Information Research Center, capacity building training and assistance in successfully obtaining the first grant to help DC promote exports. These accomplishments have significantly benefited the nonprofit organizations in DC and DC residents. Public Service Award to Ms. Pat Gaskin Henry. In recognition of her hard work, compassion, and her consistent achievement of excellence in producing the funding and alert and in everything that she does. She has been a tireless leader in guiding and serving her students, nonprofit leaders, DC residents, and citizens, fellow citizens. She is an unsung hero and a true role model of world-class public servant and a civic leader. Life Life Achievement Award presented to Ms. Kathy DeBow with our gratitude and admiration for exemplifying the Friendship Archway spirit in a lifetime of service to Washington, D.C. community, giving freely of her time with enthusiasm, kindness, generosity, and professionalism. Her dedication to the greater good has made a phenomenal difference in providing a good example and creating opportunities for both individuals and nonprofits with shared goals to build a better world for all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Ta. Please proceed. Good morning, council member. Uh, Good morning. Kenya, my country, Kenya. <laughs> uh, staff, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow, a nonprofit organization based here in Washington, D.C. We focus on veterans and homeless, homeless veterans and homeless. I'm one of the participants of SPA in 2008 and 2009. Um, I want to thank Mr. Lafayette, Pat, and uh, the Bokadi Tebo, and the staff. I want to say to you, council member, there is no other organizations as we hear all the hearing better than Office of Partnership because without it, there cannot be a city, there cannot be a community because all these organizations you see here in the district, non-profit like mine, were supported by the Office of Grants and Partnership. You as a council member, you are in a community where there is peace, where you can be accessible to shopping without problem, without further, we may have some small criminals or violence, but because of us, non-profits, who focus on violence, conflicts, and all these things, is because of uh, Office of the Crowns that supports us through capacity building, through trainings, through seminars, funding a lot, and there's nothing better in this city, as the mayor said, other than uh, non-profit. It's very, very crucial and it's very important that it's supported fina financially so that other non-profits can work with you. Other than that, the city would be in a mess, uh, war, more crime and many other things. But because of this office, it's very, very important. I'm one of the particip participants and I serve the homeless, I go, I talk to them and because of the cleanliness of this city, it may, the city may be doing a lot of work, but people like us are more of encouragement and participant and part of the, the community and the city. So there is no better department that can be given more money than Office of the Grant. If there is more money to be added, as uh, Mr. Lafayette, uh, as the boss said, the, close, the office was being closed. There were 10 people, and these 10 people, they have to depend on volunteers like her, and sometimes people don't have time. So I think uh, with your good leadership and uh, who lives in the community, add more money, and we want this office to go on and to go back to the uh, capacity building because that's how people know what they can do, how they can help the community, and what part they can play. So it's very, very important to have this office and put more money in this office. And by doing that, the city, you as the chairman, and other council members, and the mayor will be happy of our good work. And thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Seguero. Uh, I only have a couple of questions. I really appreciate each of you coming down to testify uh, here this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to know, 
which of the uh, office's resources have you found most helpful? If you've contacted the Office of Partnerships and Grants, or if you've come down to, to use the Resource Center, uh, what, what have you found has been more help, most helpful for you in, in sort of building capacity in your organization? I find it, I find their office more, because we go to foundation, because if the office closes at the foundation, I have to pay for paper, printing paper, even looking for grants, and there is time limit, but when we have an appointment with the caddy and uh, in the office, of, they take you through everything, and when we print a paper, like a document that we will go to study at home, we don't pay the money, they'll give us the document, can go with it, but at foundation, we have to pay for it, so I find this office most important to me and other non-profit organization and to you. Okay. Um, the office for the grants program, they only have two people. So they're already at the bare, bare minimum. So it is already a very good investment for the DC to leverage. For example, our office is all volunteers for many years. So they leverage and help to inspire a lot of people, which is a very good investment in order to help accomplish a lot of the things that D.C. government does not have the resources to do. So they're already at the bare minimum. Is there any program or resource uh, that the office currently does not uh, have or offer to nonprofits that you'd like to see? Yes, um, the U back in 2002, they had the ongoing training uh, and at this time, like they mentioned, that they had to ask a volunteer to do that, like all the grants writing classes, all their coaching on the whole process. It's very unique. We would never have understood <laughs> that that's, that's the process. And you don't, you know, there's nowhere to learn that. So it's extremely important for people who are passionate about really giving back and helping DC to have a place where they can learn what is the process and how do you do it right and, and to get help. So all of their coaching, all their support, all their capacity building, all their training, they're real critical to achieving the vision that the mayor has and the district council has for a better quality of life in DC. Okay, well I appreciate uh, again each of you coming down this afternoon to testify. Uh, I don't have any additional questions for you at this Thank point. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we're going to move on to our government witness uh, for the Office of Partnerships and Grant Services, and that's Director uh, Lafayette Barnes and, and whomever else he'd like to testify uh, on behalf of the government. If you can each remain standing and raise your right hands before you are seated. Uh, do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you, and uh, please be seated. Good afternoon to each of you, and, and Mr. Bond, you can begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Council Member or Chairman McDuffie, and members of the Committee on Oper Government Operations. Again, I am Lafayette Barnes, Director of the Office of Partnerships and Grant Services, a program unit of the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs, headed by Mr. Steve Glauday. I would like to recognize that Pat Henry, the Deputy Director of, o of OPGS, and Dr. Jim Hurley, the Agency Fiscal Officer, are here today uh, for today's hearing on the FY uh, 2014 budget. Although Pat and Jim are not presenting a written testimony, they are here to answer any questions that you might have for us today. On behalf of the Executive Office of the Mayor, I am pleased to testify before you today on the Mayor's or Mayor Gray's FY 2014 budget in confidence and confidently share that the Office of Partnerships and Grant Services FY 2014 proposed budget fully addresses OPGS's funding needs for this respective fiscal period. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mayor Gray's 2014 budget submission, submission focuses on three priorities, growing and diversifying the economy, educating our children and preparing our workforce for a new economy, and improving the quality of life for our residents. OPGS's FY14 proposed budget supports the mayor's budget priorities through its mission to enhance the capacity of district government agencies, community, faith-based, and nonprofit organizations 
to identify and to identify, apply, and secure competitive grant and related resources. In addition, OPGS directs the district government's donations management and solicitation process and facilitates the development of collaborative relationships among local government agencies and nonprofit service providers. The mayor's FY 2014 budget proposes $336,470 in total operating funds for OPGS's personnel and non-personnel services to support its mission and core services. The mayor's 2014 proposed budget allocates $326,407 to support three FTE salaries and fringe benefits and $10,000 to pay for supplies, materials, and other service and services and charges during this fiscal period. Please note that approximately 6,000 of OPGS's non-personal service funding supports the purchase of grant development and related resources. The Mayor's FY 2014 proposed budget for OPGS reflects an increase of $4,663 above the, fifth, the office's FY 2013 total budget allocation of $331,807. OPGS also anticipates a modest growth in its personal services budget because of the mayor's recent 3% uh, cost of living increase. Thus, OPGS's FY14 pr budget proposal will enable OPGS's staff to continue to produce its weekly funding alert, provide capacity building technical assistance and training to local nonprofits and especially those small and emerging nonprofits, operating the Grant Information Resource Center and directs the district agencies wide agency wide donation solicitation and management process. In addition, OPGS will continue to partner with the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs and other district agencies, recruit and train local university fellows, and solicit other volunteers to augment its operational capacity to deliver its core services during this fiscal period. To date, OPGS does not have any FTE vacancies, inter-district funds, federal grant funds, or contracts to report to the committee for FY 2014. However, OPGS does plan to actively pursue all potential opportunities for competitive grants, donations, and inter-district funds to fully implement its workforce development nonprofit collaboration project. The project advances the Mayor's One City Action Plan efforts to promote opportunities in neighborhoods by training district nonprofits to deliver more effective employment services. This two-year pilot initiative will enhance local workforce development service providers' capacity to collaborate in order to strengthen their job readiness, job placement, and job retention services that address the high unemployment rate that exists in the District of Columbia. In closing, Chairman McDuffie, let me state that OPGS remains steadfast in its commitment to support its mission, core services, customers, and the Mayor's FY 2014 budget. I would like to take this opportunity to invite local nonprofits, community, and faith-based organizations to attend the Office of Partnerships and Grant Services 13th Annual Public-Private Partnership Conference entitled Moving Forward, Building Greater Sustainability at the World Bank Preston Auditorium on Friday, June the 7th. Those interested, I would invite to please visit our website at www.opgs.dc.gov or call our office at 202-727-8900 for more, for more details about the conference and to register. This concludes my written testimony, and I am available to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you, uh, Chairman McDowell. Thank you uh, for your testimony, Director uh, Barnes. I really don't have very many questions for you. I think your budget is, is pretty straightforward. It is, like you mentioned in your testimony, it's only a modest uh, increase in FY14 of, of $5,000. Right. Um, so, so my question is, is limited. I will note for the record, I'm sure you heard uh, uh, that the chorus of supporters who testified uh, in, in the previous two panels about all the great work that you all are doing in the office. And so it was, it was, it was great to hear uh, those folks talk about all the capacity building and the services that you all provide, uh, uh, albeit 
with very few uh, FTEs uh, in the office. So, so your work is appreciated clearly from the from the folks who testified. Uh, up to five thousand dollars. I think you mentioned part of that is is, is going to be uh, to to represent the cost of living adjustment. That's correct. Uh, that's planned. And uh, is there about I guess two thousand dollars or so is going to be used for something else? Is that going to be NPS budget or PS? That's NPS budget, and, okay. and that'll primarily uh, pay for other supplies and materials to to operate the office. Okay. Okay. And let me just say about the. Uh, the proposed uh, or the uh, the three uh, percent cola increase, we're estimating that to be about nine thousand dollars in P in PS uh, dollars for the coming year. We haven't actually received that yet because that's just becoming effective, as you know. Okay. And you've got three FTEs. That's right. And it's that's not going to change for for FY fourteen. Uh, is that sufficient to to execute the office mission? I always ask this question. I know I that the answer is pretty standard with each and agency. Let, let me give you the standard response. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly support the mayor's budget, but but would also welcome any changes that he uh, might deem necessary to uh, enhance our operations moving forward. Other than that, we'll continue to do the best we can with what we have, and certainly the support we receive from the mayor's office of community affairs helps us in that effort as well. Uh, the mayor has, has talked a lot about the one city uh, fund that he's he's proposed, and uh, which I think is a good proposal. Uh, would your office have any role in that? Would it just be essentially letting folks know about opportunities, or, or is there any role you envision? It? Well, and let me say that it's my understanding, and I certainly support the mayor's position that his intent is to make sure that the grant uh, administration of of the one city fund, I think, this is what you're talking about, the 15 million that he's proposed, to be outside of the government. And so the Community Foundation for the National Capital Region will have that responsibility. Anything that we can do to help uh, in that effort, particularly as it relates to promoting those grant opportunities through our funding alert, or as you heard from some of the earlier witnesses, that we can continue to support the capacity building training to make sure that those nonprofits in our city are prepared to uh, you know, uh, apply for those opportunities, we're, we're more than welcome to help uh, in that effort. Okay. And I only have uh, one, one final question. Uh, in your 2014 spending plan, uh, you budgeted funds for services and charges? That's correct. Uh, is there uh, uh, what does that represent? Services and charges, again, it's, it's roughly uh, $10,000 for FY14. Six of that, $6,000 of that will support subscriptions from the Foundation Center. And we have uh, several a grant funding uh, subscriptions that we pay for so that our customers can access that and the remainder of that money will primarily support uh, maintenance and other supplies that we need to operate the office. Okay. Uh, that, that concludes the questions that I have prepared um, uh, for you, uh, Mr. Barnes, and, and uh, at this point is there anything else that you'd like to add that you haven't already stated in your testimony? The only thing I would like to add is that I certainly uh, would like to uh, thank those uh, nonprofits from the community who came out to support the office today and certainly want to recognize the work that our three FTEs and volunteers are doing to make sure that we continue to provide first rate services to the nonprofit community here in the District of Columbia. Other than that, thank you for the opportunity. Sure, no, I appreciate you coming down to testify. And like I said uh, uh, to one of the witnesses on the previous panel, I've had the opportunity to observe. Uh, the work that you all do, uh, and, it, and it's good work that you all do, and, and it's always great to know that uh, nonprofits throughout the city are benefiting from uh, the services that your agency provides. So please keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Next, we're going to move on uh, to the Department of General Services. Uh, we're going to hear first from our public witnesses, and I just want to note uh, that DGS currently operates on a budget of over $350 million and 713.2 FTEs. For their FY14 budget, DGS is requesting over $388 million and 678 FTEs. The budget to support DGS's operation is quite large because DGS was created by the consolidation of several agencies and or agency functions. DGS's mission is to elevate the quality of life of the district with superior construction, first-rate maintenance, and expert real estate management. In addition, DGS is responsible for capital improvement, real estate acquisitions, building management, security, and the list goes on. Meticulous oversight of DGS's budget is important not only because it is the committee's duty, but also because DGS plays such a critical role in almost every other district agency's capital needs. Particularly, DGS is responsible for modernizing and closing district public schools and building and maintaining recreation centers. After hearing from the public witnesses, we will hear from uh, Mr. Hanlon, who is director of DGS, uh, with respect to how DGS intends to use the funds program in fiscal year 2014 to execute its mission. With that, I'm going to call up our first panel of public witnesses. Core Masters Barry, it's good to see you. Demisa Robinson, Ronnie Goodall, We've got a number of uh, witnesses from the Capitol Hill Cluster Schools, and so I want to call you up to the extent we can on, on panels together. So I'm going to skip you all to see if we have one more person to round out this panel. Is Sylvia Robinson present? Georgia Avenue Community Development Task Force. Any, anybody from that organization? Is Mark Patterson? Yes. Here? And I generally begin from either my left or my right, but since you're seated in the middle, Ms. Uh, Masters Barry, I will begin with you since you're number one on the list. Uh, good afternoon to each of you, and please begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. I am Core Masters Barry, Chief Executive Officer of the Recreation Wish List Committee and founder of the Southeast Tennessee Learning Center. Thank you, Chairman Duffy and the Committee on Government Operations for allowing me to speak today on behalf of the Recreation Wish List Committee and the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. The Recreation Wish List Committee was founded in 1995 to improve the quality of education and recreational opportunities for our children so that all of our children had safe places to play and learn in their own neighborhoods. Equally important, our goals are to give District of Columbia children opportunities to be academically competitive as well as socially and culturally competent as they grow and learn. To achieve these goals, in 2001, the RWLC and the District of Columbia's Department of Parks and Recreation joined forces to open the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center, a state-of-the-art tennis and fitness facility that also features a library, classrooms, <coughs> computer lab with 17 stations and supervised access to the Internet. But that isn't where this vision started. It started on old tennis courts, the one that most people don't remember or know about. Where our building now stands used to be the home of four outdoor courts. They were in pretty bad shape, but I still played tennis there, and a lot of the kids played tennis there with former coach recently passed, Dr. Arnold McKnight, who was the first director of the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. We had to clean needles and drug paraphernalia off of those courts every morning, but we played tennis. Dr. McKnight and I used to talk about how great it would be to have the courts upgraded, but to also have a place where the kids could get training in the sport of tennis and improve their minds with tutoring, mentoring, and computer literacy. 
1995, the Recreation Wish List Committee launched a capital campaign to raise money to build the Southeast Tennyson Learning Center. D.C. government, after RWLC raised a significant amount of money to build the center, we partnered with the D.C. government and the D.C. Department of Parks and Recreation under the leadership of Mayor Anthony Williams, who contributed the remaining capital funds to ensure a center that surrounding neighborhood and the entire city would recognize as a statement of excellence and hope. Over the last 12 years, thousands of children and teens, mostly from Ward 8, have been drawn to the center by its tennis programs and have been benefited from its education programs. RWLC and DPR have succeeded in using tennis as a hook to attract children and teens to the center's academic programs. The RWLC has truly served as the friends of SCTLC, raising funds for the center and its youth programs, ensuring adequate staffing for the academic and youth tennis, pro providing e tennis equipment, and creating new opportunities and cultural experiences for the young people it serves. Through RWLC, supported structured ac academic and cultural en en enrichment programs, children and teens build social and life skills, strengthen academic abilities, and gain the confidence they need to succeed both on and off the court. We've been in business for the last 12 years, trying to meet the needs of the community. I don't think I need to tell you about those needs, but for the record, I will briefly just go through some statistics. Our, our unemployment rate in Ward 8 is triple that of the district. The academic performance of children in Ward 8 lag behind others in the city. Summer learning loss is a significant problem, especially in Ward 8. Crime is a very serious problem. And a 2009 survey of the D.C. residents who found that children often feel unsafe kept many in, keeping many indoors during their free time and contributing to a high level of childhood, childhood obesity in southeast Washington. Our programs are really important to our community. We address transitional changes and challenges among the challenges facing youth, Queens and teens frequently have difficult transitions from one school to the next. Middle school students often receive lower grades than they did in elementary school. Adjusting to high school brings similar changes, resulting in high rates of students repeating the ninth grade and dropping out in the tenth. Studies point to multiple reasons for these shifts. RWLC and SETLC make concerted efforts to help youth deal with changes and overcome challenges that threaten to derail education and futures. The onset of puberty may cause behavioral and difficult pro and, and developmental problems that affect academic performances. Our after-school academic and tennis programs provide both structure and stability and set high standards on academic performance and behavior. When everything else in their lives is changing, RWLC and SETLC provide a level of consistency that creates a safe haven for youth helping them stay on track. And I have a, I see that the light is red, but I want to continue, if you allow me, uh, because there we have significant programs. We have a summer setup program that deals with learning loss. Every year we consistently increase reading and math scores in 2012 only alone, we increased reading by 17% and math by 23%. The program is more than just reading and math, for example. Not only do the kids play tennis, but we bring in people from the community that participate in a read aloud program. Mentors from our community that we're very familiar with, people like Mark Irons, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Johnetta Cole, Scott Bowden, and I can go on and on with council members. And you'll be invited yourself, council member, this summer to do a read aloud, so put it on your calendar. <laughs> Parents tend to be less involved in their children's education as they move on to schools, middle school and high school. Parents also have an ally and an advocate in their child's education among RWLC and SETLC staff. Ethnic identity grows stronger during middle and high school years. We deal with that a lot, but one of our programs that we have that is very well known, and I think some of your staff has attended that program, is Blacks and Wax. It's, uh, I see your staff is smiling. They, they attended that, and great things happen in small rooms. And the Blacks and Wax is a program that uh, is a creative, effective, and exciting production that educates and entertains through the arts. 
combining drama, music, and dance and theater. The youth of SCTLC bring African American history to the life for school groups, family and friends, and theater patrons. And we can go on and on and on. And why am I telling you all of this? It's because this facility, though it has served the community well, is in dire need of upgrades and improvement to not only continue to serve the community, but serve it in a larger and a more significant way. We have issues with our tennis, which is our hook facility, and there has been a discussion about improving this facility for over six years. Finally, the mayor stepped up, thank, thank him for that, and proposed uh, an increase, I mean, I'm sorry, a renovation budget that we are very happy about. I gave you about 50 pictures that I want you to look at. Just, you know, I think a picture is worth a thousand words in terms of the deficiencies, both health and safety. Uh, that the kids are facing. There are functional designs, tennis courts, tennis courts face in the wrong direction. To enter the tennis bubble, you have to go outside and then you must go, you have to go inside then outside, which is a huge problem, especially in climate weather. The tennis bubble covers itself is inadequate. It has various holes, it has, um, it floods, uh, it has areas uh, that have been compromised due to vandalism, big slashes in the, um, canvas. The ventilation in the tennis bubble is terrible. In the summer months the air is unbearable and hot and in the summer it is unbearably cold. There's water leakage through the roof from the side of the building on the ground as well as water seep seepage running down the walls and form under the ground. The water leakage in the tennis bubble makes air humid as well as there are many locations that have mold and mildew, mildew building up which also causes bad air quality. Students complain about asthma and allergies as well as other respiratory related issues. The SCTLC tennis bubble has even had gas leakage that caused us to, re to render the ventilator dysfunctional in the interest of health and safety. The lights in the tennis bubble are not bright enough to give enough light to the tennis courts and makes it hard for tennis players to see, especially at night. Marketability. CCCS still has an audit tennis players and adult tennis leagues that bring revenue to the District of Columbia. We are losing that market due to the above mentioned issues. Adult tennis is critical due to the fact that adults are our highest paying customers and they need exercise also. And SCTLC relies on them to generate income for the facility and DPR. At the rate of deterioration of this facility, we're losing our ability to be competitive with others in the surrounding area. Not to mention we're not properly serving our students and our community. Replacement of this tennis bubble has been in discussion for the past six years with numerous walkthroughs. Nothing has been done and the bubble continues to deteriorate. There are so, these are some, only some of the problems with the tennis bubble. It's only my hope to soon resolve these problems. Again, I want to thank the mayor for recognizing the need and proposing something to do about it. Again, thank you for allowing me to testify today. With me is Mr. Demisa Robinson, Director of Tennis at the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center, who will share more information with you on these matters. Let me, let me first thank you, uh, Ms. Mastersberry, for your testimony. I will note that um, uh, I did indulge his testimony, um, um, and, and I don't know if it, Mr. Robinson has written testimony he wants to provide, but uh, in the interest of time, is there anything that you want to offer that, that Ms. Barry uh, perhaps did not incorporate in her testimony? So we could, because we got a number of parents who came down to testify uh, on, on this committee as well. Um, yes, I would love to testify. Yes, I would love to testify um, if, if, about if the sin. Okay, all right. <laughs> We're going to have to keep you to three minutes if, if that's okay. Okay, that's fine. Right. That's fine. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to you, McDuffie, and your colleagues for giving me the opportunity and platform to be able to discuss and, uh, and be an ambassador for the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. Um, just a little quick background. I'm a Washington, D.C. native, grew up in the area, um, and used tennis as my denominator, you know, it's been a common denominator for me in life. And I mean, I've grown, I've traveled a lot, I've played professional tennis, I've been able to see the world. And myself, I've actually grew up in a similar program that Southeast Tennis and Learning Center offers now for the kids within Ward 8 in that area. So I really feel passionate and I pretty much understand her vision and her goals to, to reach and touch these kids' lives. And I really feel like it's a great, great opportunity to, with expansions, to reach out to more kids so they can benefit from this particular facility. Um, I also 
just to piggyback on what Ms. Berry said, the facility we definitely need to upgrade because we could definitely be doing more to serve our kids and reach out more to customers in, in our community. Uh, our Southeast tennis programs have been compromised due to space and resource limitations. We've actually had to turn children and paying customers away to accommodate for the high demands because of limited court availability, deteriorating court services, lack of staff and fitness resources, and substandard training technologies as well. So with that being said, a, a, quick, a good renovation um, and new expansion is a goal to meet the needs of our children and programs while broadening our community and children that we serve. We have reached our capacity in September 2011 through August 2012. We supported about 400 children in our yearly junior programs. We also hosted USTA sanctioned tournaments and tennis play days, attracting additional 200 kids. Within the same time frame, we accommodated about 200 adults, including seniors in our adult programs, which I might add yields our highest revenue, like Ms. Berry mentioned earlier. But we, we have to turn people away. We have to turn people away because, I mean, we just don't have enough courts, especially especially in the wintertime with four courts. Um, so having new renovations would definitely add to that. And in order for business to continue to grow and serve more children, um, we need that renovation to happen. Um, with this expansion, we will add new products and services to our existing programs as well, which will help generate revenue for the center at the same time. Um, sustaining resources of our growing environment. Keys to success for the Southeast Tennessee Learning Center. Acquire sufficient and qualified staffing to run, manage the facility and its daily operations efficiently. And I'm coming from a point of view of a tennis director. Just right now, at the current moment, we're not properly staffed. So it's tough for me to it's tough for me to uh, run my programs the way I would love to run them. How many staff members do you have? Right now, we have three coaches, okay. three full-time coaches. And I have some more questions for you, but I do want to I want to get to um, okay. to Mr. Uh, um, Patterson, who's also seated on this panel. Mr. Patterson, thank you. Go ahead. My name is Mark Patterson, and I thank the committee for giving me time to testify. I'm the chairman of the school improvement team at Shepherd Elementary in Ward 4. For your uh, parents, staff, and community members visited other D.C. public schools and conducted a floor-by-floor -floor examination of our own school to assess what we needed and what we wanted to avoid. By the time DGS entered the picture, we were ahead of the game and gave them a copy of our 47-page report in mid-December. The first indication I got that things at DGS were a little screwy is when Jackie Stanley, one of DGS's PR people, asked me to send her an advanced copy of anything I intended to write for, say, the school newsletter. I mean, really? I mean, I did it the first time, two days before the newsletter deadline, and I got no response. So I believe that it's more important to keep our primary constituency, parents, involved and informed as much as possible than it is to run every newsletter submission through DGS first. Further, I would not accuse DGS of a culture of secrecy per se, but more of a culture of clamming up. DGS's Hubert Braithwaite is the point man who runs our school improvement team meetings now. I asked him detailed questions last month because I believe we were losing traction on renovations and losing sight of the big picture. But he said he couldn't answer my questions even though he's sitting right next to me at the table. No, I've got to send him to, you guessed it, Jackie Stanley. Oh, come on. So after questions from me and Keith White, our school improvement team vice chair kept getting unanswered. I finally sent an email to both Stanley and Braithwaite that I'd be testifying at this hearing and their ability to respond to our queries would be considered in how I structured my testimony. Well, lo and behold, in 38 minutes time, I got responses to several questions. Judging from the detail and the answers, I'd say they took more than 38 minutes to have researched and written those responses, meaning they had them in hand already. I've attached the email chain to my testimony electronically. Now, my personal peek aside, I now wonder whether what Shepherd's going to look like come fall. DGS has also been somewhat vague, even in dealing with representatives of Turner Construction, a contractor. There's 10 weeks to summer vacation, but you've got to have the materials, machinery, and manpower in place to get the work done. Turner's Tom Engers assures us that by the time school starts up again, we'll have a functional school. Well, good grief. Our school's functional right now, albeit suboptimally. Ours is supposed to be a school improvement team, not a school functionality team. 
we've already had to postpone a community meeting on the proposed renovations twice. I see saw too many screw ups and other work for school renovations because the contractor was under the gun and under deadline pressure. We only get one chance to do this right. And if it's not, I'll be pointing fingers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Patterson, uh, and, and each of the members of the panel. Uh, Ms. Barron, you talked about, and so did uh, uh, Mr. Robinson, the, the need for renovations and improvements uh, at the uh, uh, Tennis and Learning Center. And I think you uh, started to talk a little bit, uh, Mr. Robinson, about some of the specific uh, improvements that are necessary. You want to elaborate on that? Yes. Um, some of the renovations and improvements needed for the center, um, obviously, in more indoor courts, because during our winter season, I mean, we're limited with four courts, which limits our programs and how many kids we can have involved. Um, like I said, we had to turn a couple of kids away because of that simple fact right there, just have a small course. So we're able to expand our indoor facility for one. We'll be able to serve more kids and get them more involved in our programs. And then secondly, the just the conditions of the courts, um, especially in the cold winters. I'll go back to that again. I just remember being in there, the heat being faulty and kids having to play in the cold weather and rain leakage into the facility and it pretty much takes like manpower of three hours. Anytime we have heavy rains we have to go through a whole process of vacuuming the courts and you know when we could be doing other things. Now, now the facility is not that old so I mean is there it's, any... It's, it, there are tears within the fabrics on the side of the facility somehow some way from just wear and tear. Okay. I mean over the type of is a fabric structure and over time it just tends to start to tear and, gotcha. and just and rip apart. Can I add to that? Sure absolutely. Uh, since I was there at the very beginning of the construction the, the, the actual building itself is in great shape. Okay. We, we do a good job. We invest in that. The kids invest in that and the, real, and the building is fine. The actual uh, outdoor court, it, the lifespan is 10 years mm -hmm. in any, that, that type of fabric. But you add to that the vandalism that has taken place, you know, the cutting the sides of the canvas that are big enough for really a person to get through. It just has deteriorated through wear, tear, and, and vandalism. And whenever, it, we don't need a renovation, we need a new one. Gotcha. You can't renovate what we have. You have to tear it down and start all over again with some state of the art. And I'm sure that whatever is replaced with will have a much longer lifespan and a much uh, much stronger you know, ability to sustain, sustain not only the elements, but the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let me ask, uh, um, and I'll probably go back and forth with my questions, but Mr. Patterson, um, you, you said you're the head of the, the SIT team at Shepherd uh, Elementary, and uh, I found it curious that you uh, mentioned that you submitted your newsletter um, to DGS in advance. Were you, were you asked to do that? Yes. By whom? By Jackie Stanley at the very first meeting of all the professionals with all the civilian members okay. of the school was this, that was, was in January. Did she provide you any, any basis for, for No, it just seemed to be protocol, process. Okay, so I did it and didn't get a response. And Well, I've done a column every other week in the school newsletter since. And Do you still submit them to DGI? Oh, no. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, that's the first I've ever heard of that, so I just found it. Well, it's the first I had ever heard of it, too. I'm curious that that would be the case. Okay. And, um... Mr. Robinson, how many kids are you all serving? Uh, we're serving the total, on average, uh, I have it right here, sir. On average, each session we're serving the, uh, uh, 73 kids. Okay, and do you right see now. more kids typically during the, the warmer uh, weather months? Yes, especially during our summer camps. Okay, okay. But I imagine it's not a... It's not a Trying to serve the kids during the winter time uh, uh, indoors, and you said you're limited to how many courts? Four. Okay. okay. And it's very important because in the winter, the kids have, I mean, they got choices. They can either hang out after school and get in trouble, or they can come there and, and get, you know, their lives enhanced and empowered. So we don't like to turn kids away, mm -hmm. but we try to provide uh, an environment that education and, and uh, and, and recreation go hand in hand. If you're going to come for the education programs, which are quite extensive, then you have to play tennis. But it's difficult to hold to that 
And then again, we have a lot of kids in our community that are suffering from obesity. We want to get them on the court. We want them to move around. We want them in the conditioning room. But it gets to a point that you have too many kids on a court. You're not either going to serve them like you should, both in terms of numbers versus staff, and also teaching them like they should learn. So we've been being very creative about it, but we're not doing what we could do. And, the, and, the, and you would be surprised that the demand is very high. They're very excited about it. I'm very, I love that part of it. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised the demand is very high. I know that there are a lot of kids throughout the city who, who want structured programming, uh, who need structured programming in their lives. Uh, and, and I know uh, as a result of the work that you all are doing uh, and others throughout the city who offer uh, the type of programming, um, that structure, it gives kids an outlet. Uh, it really puts them on a pathway to success uh, through recreation, obviously uh, emphasizing recreation, but also education, which is, which is a critical component to their success. So I appreciate everything that you all are doing. Uh, I appreciate you all coming out to testify. I did want to ask before we, uh, 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 this panel is over, Mr. Patterson, uh, as a member of the SIT team, what improvements would you suggest uh, be made to the process? Well, we could use a little more transparency, a little more honest back and forth. If there are reasons why some design elements are not in phase one, but instead in phase two, or vice versa, then there must be budget considerations made or estimates having been made as to the cost. For instance, let's say that this table were all right angles, but instead here we have a little curve, a little bump up. Well, we've got the same situation where they want to put the media center. So they want to do a little bump out. Well, how much does that bump out cost? Well, I still haven't gotten an answer to that question, but somebody somewhere must have some idea as to what it costs because redoing the media center, you know, is going to be part of, you know, maybe the fiscal 14 budget. You know, I've already asked before the education committee about adding uh, money to the supplemental 2013 budget so that we can get phase one renovations done without a lot of displacement or without a loss of functionality. How many members are on your sit, sit team for Shepherd? Well, we've had, when you have parents and community members, teachers and staff, and students, now we've got four students who are members, we have had probably 16 rotating in and out PTA presidents and vice presidents because those usually change at the new school year. And how long has the SIT team been meeting? We started a year ago, January. Okay. And, and I sort of sense your frustration, and that's why I asked the question about what you think needed to be, uh, or what suggestions you might have in improving the process. And if you, if you can't, and I'll let you uh, respond, but if, if you can't think of everything here, you can feel free to submit uh, any information to the committee that you think might enhance the uh, school improvement team process. Uh, we've got some schools uh, throughout the city uh, that are going to be engaging in the, the city team process just as you all are now and I'm always interested in hearing uh, from, from the perspective of parents, teachers and students uh, who participate what they think could be done a little differently to enhance the process and I know DGS similarly uh, likes to get steady feedback in, in the process so they can improve it from there. Uh, so you want to respond? That I will do, but I'll probably have to do that more electronically in consultation with the other school improvement team members who you know, kind of delegate me to do this kind of work. But for the record, I just want to say that I'm not going to try and parlay my leadership in school renovations at my school into a city council bid. So I'm not sure what that means, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll close on that. Uh, did you want to offer something? I just want to just uh, say that we have submitted for the record uh, a letter from you. Mr. Goodell was supposed to be had an emergency. So uh, from the, uh, the D.C. United States Tennis Association, and I just want to make sure that sure. that's included. Sure, no, we can, we, we'll take that. Uh, okay, uh, and I also program. just want to say, though this is going to be renovations for the indoor courts and hopefully outdoor courts, mm -hmm. we have had some minor renovations that have made a great deal of a difference at, in the main structure itself uh, in DGS has been the one who has provided it. And uh, unlike Kim, we've had a great experience with their uh, due diligence and following up and following through, and I'm looking forward to working with them on this major renovation. Okay. Uh, again, I want to thank each of the members of the panel for coming down and testifying. Thank you. Afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Next, we uh, want to hear from Karen Ernst, Rochelle Frazier, and Philip Brady. Whoever wants to start first, you want to we'll start from um, uh, with Mr. Brady. Great. Please begin. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to each of you. Good afternoon, Councilman uh, McDuffie and the members of the committee. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity to provide our testimony in support of full funding for Stuart Hobson. My name is Philip Brady. I'm a neighbor of the school. I do not have any children going to the school, but I am the leader of the SIT team. It's been working diligently on this project since uh, December of 2011. Um, too often, when we're comparing our personally improved schools to what they were, why can we not compare our schools to what they should be? And looking at Stuart Hobson, why should we care now that it was abandoned for 86 years? Why should we pat ourselves on the back that something has been done when that something is not enough. Should our schools not be glasses that are simply full? How could anyone look at Stuart Hobson and say that fixing up the classrooms but abandoning athletic and recreation space is anything other than a project half done? A middle school should have everything that is necessary for the full development potential of its students. And that includes exterior athletic and recreation spaces as indicated in our current education specification, as indicated in current education specifications around the country, including our own DCPS. As Thomas Jefferson said, exercise and recreation are as necessary as reading, or rather, more necessary because health is worth more than learning. We must stop debating whether the Stuart Hobson glass is half full or, or half empty. It should just be full. The current allocated 2014 budget is of $11 million with a mayor's office recommendation of adding to it $6 million to finish the interior. Uh, we're asking that the project be fully funded so that we reach the $23 million for 2014 that would prevent this from being a half done project which would not be good for anybody. I think it's important here to mention uh, a by the way, which is a misunderstanding that this project is over budget. And that is not true. In fact, it is right on track with its budget. The $34 million that was allocated for the modernization of Stuart Hobson was based on very old antiquated CIP numbers that were created artificially and long before the project even existed. Once the project actually started, that education specifications were written and design, schematic designs were looked at um, and examined both by contractor and architect estimating groups. A budget number comparable to the number that we're looking at right now was the actual budget. Um, if DGS does not get the funding it needs to build a minimum size athletic field and the minimum parking required per building code then it will cut both in half and still build them. Half of the minimum required space for athletic translates to no athletic field at all, but instead a swatch of turf only good for limited play activity other than athletics. And I realize that I'm running over time. If I could have permission to continue. Yeah, if, you wanna, if you want to, I, I don't, obviously I want to indulge you all because this is a very important issue. Yes. Uh, just bear in mind that there are other people who, who just like you would like to testify, I'd like to give an opportunity to summarize. I understand. Thank you. Um, we spent too much time dancing around the truth regarding the exterior of Stuart Hobson. We need outdoor space for the students and we need adequate parking for staff. Because of the unique reality of the site that slopes significantly down to the north, both of these can be achieved for a low cost of an additional six million dollars which we are requesting. That being said, we know the money is not growing trees. If additional funds cannot be made available for 2014, then it should be made available for 2015, and DGS should be directed to plan design accordingly and not create a half-baked solution that will forever limit the true potential of Stuart Hobson. Um, 
why should it be too much that we ask to finish Stuart Hobson? Finishing Stuart Hobson would strengthen the feeder path to Eastern High School. Finishing Stuart Hobson would help balance the public charter discrepancies. Finishing Stuart Hobson would help address inequalities of wards that have typically favored Northwest for all the wrong reasons. Finishing Stuart Hobson is the right thing to do for Stuart Hobson. It's also the right thing to do for the future of this city. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your testimony, uh, Mr. Brady. Uh, if you want to proceed next, Ms. Frazier. Um, yes. Good afternoon. I've been here a whole while, so I thought it was still warm. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> um, but good afternoon, Chairperson uh, McDuffie. My name is Rochelle Gray, and I'm the parent of two students that attend Stuart Hobson Middle School. And I'm here today so to request additional money so that we can complete the renovations that are needed sorely needed. In fact, I have three children and we've been part of the Capitol Hill Cluster School for more than eight years. My daughter is on the Stuart Hobson um, volleyball team and they worked really hard and they made it to the playoffs. And during the fall of 2012, Stuart Hobson played Deal Middle School at Deal. And my other children and I attended in support Upon entering the school, my children were enamored by the beauty of the school. The hallways were bright, they were spacious, they were clean. And as we searched for the gym and took a mini tour of the building, they were, as was I, awestruck. They then verbalized their strong desire to attend Deal for the next school year. At this point, they knew nothing of Deal's academic record. But being intelligent children, they were able to immediately make a physical comparison between Deal and Stuart Hobson. During this conversation among the three of them, they became disheartened when they realized the awful state of their school. Overhearing the conversation and in an effort to quickly reduce their dissatisfaction with the current state of Stuart Hobson, I reminded them that Stuart Hobson is currently undergoing renovations and that they would soon be proud of and excited about their own school. I am fully aware that Deal has been totally renovated and sits on a larger land footprint and we are not um, attempting to build another structure like Deal. But we feel that you, well, our, our children um, are just, just under so, I mean, it's just a grave injustice by not allocating the needed and necessary funds to complete the renovation of Stuart Hobson as quickly as possible. The children and staff have been remarkably patient and have endured a construction zone for far too long. Um, and if I can direct you to the second page of my um, testimony, there is, um, that's a photo of the hallway at Stuart Hobson where we have vinyl tarps hanging across the ceiling. And this is what they've been looking at since the beginning of the school year. And I think that's deplorable. I would like for you all to, can I continue? You can, you can continue. And I'm going to summarize. Bring it in. Okay. Sure, sure. I would like for you all to consider and acknowledge that a child's academic success is not only tied to competent and caring teachers and administrators, but it is also tied to their physical building environment in which they can reside in for up to 10 hours a day, five days a week. While Stuart Hobson has made great strides academically with such limited um, resources, we can no longer explain and justify to our children why their school appears to be literally falling apart at the seams all around them. In closing, I'm asking that the funds be granted so that we can do the best for our children, in particular my child or children. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Gray, Ms. Ernst. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Karen Ernst. I'm the president of the PTA for the Capitol Hill Cluster School. Um, I'm going to try and keep it really short and just focus on what exactly is being done, what needs to be done, what we're asking for for this year and next. Um, as as uh, Philip pointed out, um, the money was allocated last year to do most of the job, but not all the job. But we need another six million just to finish the building. 
So that, that includes things like 3,700 square feet of space that's underneath the gymnasium right now that we cannot finish off and access. It's part of the master plan of the school, but we can't use it because there's no, el no funding for the elevator to access it or the small amount of funds that would be needed to finish it. So that's 3,700 square feet of space in a school that is this, a postage size stamp school and needs every ounce of space. Every square feet of space in that school is part of the master plan. So we need that. We need the museum um, exhibit area, which is an atrium right now that's completely useless. It's not closed in. It's just concrete and useless. All we need is the money to finish that space off and we can implement our museum program school. So um, there's $6 million that's needed just to finish the building. I know the mayor has put it in as recommended to be added into the budget for 2014. We hope city council signs off on that. Um, and then finally, it's the final $6 million that I'm, I really want to be most passionate about emphasizing with you for the exterior space. If you look at the final page of my testimony, you'll see a diagram that shows a comparison of middle schools comparable to Stuart Hobson and their outdoor space. You can see all of those little orange dots are 100 square foot per student and Stuart Hobson is spilling over. We are spilling over with um, almost, if we were to use almost the full space, we would still have more kids than we have space for. But right now, 30% of that space is dedicated to cars, not kids. 30% of it. Um, we feel very, very strongly, particularly at a middle school at Stuart Hobson that has a very dynamic athletic program. We've got football, we've got volleyball, we've got soccer, we've got basketball. We have a tremendous athletic program and we have no space for those kids to go. There is no additional parking any place else um, where, where, where we can be having our, our staff park. There's no additional recreation space nearby. The site is, is designed perfectly to be able to put in a lower level parking to provide the minimally adequate parking and to be able to do a field that goes right across the top of it that would be level with the back of the school and would provide an actual field that could be used not only by the school but by the other athletic programs in the neighborhood that are also desperate for athletic space. It's only six million dollars to finish it. I strongly, strongly urge you to please, if you add it into the 2014 budget, and if you cannot, as Philip said, at a bare minimum, let's not do the wrong thing and make half of it permanently parking space. Let's wait one year, put it in the 2015 budget, and let's do it right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Ernst, uh, and, and each of you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Ernst, I'm looking at your written testimony where uh, it has the bullets that says the $6.1 million is needed immediately to fund the following. Now, does this list reflect DGS's position that these are the things that will not be able to be completed? That's my understanding. This came from DGS. Okay. It's a couple months old, so yeah. I don't know if that's been updated. Yes, and that's, that, is, that is still uh, current and correct. Okay. And has is construction already begun, or is this? Cause I yes, see the construction is underway. The modernization is underway right now. We've okay. we've done the construction so that we don't have to move kids out of the building. So they've phased it over a multi-year time frame to keep sure. the kids in the building. And is it your understanding that the the, the FY14 proposed budget uh, for Stuart Hobson is seventeen million four hundred thirty-three dollars? That that number reflects the addition of the six million dollars that that Karen first talked about um, to finish the interior. So initially there was an allocation of eleven million dollars that has been increased to seventeen to include that six million. We're asking for the additional six million dollars to be able to finish the exterior space as well. So additional six million dollars on top of the seventeen million that's already proposed in the budget. That's correct, which would equal a total of twenty three for twenty fourteen or at least put another six into twenty fifteen if that cannot be done for twenty fourteen. Okay. All right. Uh, I understand the request at this point. Uh, I appreciate the testimony. Is there anything else that you all would like to put on the record? I know um, that you, you Obviously, you all provided written statements, and I appreciate that. So that's going to be incorporated to the rec. But is there anything you also wanted to say uh, outside of uh, what you did not have an opportunity to say at this point? Um, the only thing I would like to add is is the issue of, of phasing, because this has come up um, in conversations with other members of, of the council. And the fact is you can't do everything at once. And Stuart Hobson is a project that is where it is in the queue. 
There are other projects that have been completed, started and completed before Stuart Hobson, and there'll be other schools that we started and completed after Stuart Hobson. It is just where it is. The important thing is that we have the opportunity now, while we're doing this, to finish this right. And it behooves the city to finish this project and finish it right so that it can free up resources to go ahead and move forward with the other schools, get this project done right, and then move on. And that's for the betterment of the entire city. Now, I think you said, Mr. Brady, you were a member of the SIT team? Yes, I'm a leader of the SIT team, yes, and have been since the first day. Is anybody the SIT team? Yeah, we are. Okay, how, how do you all describe your, your experience uh, uh, engaging with uh, the government officials on the SIT team process? I, I have to say it's been an extremely positive um, uh, process. We've been working with Tom uh, Henderson, who's the direct project manager, and, and Mel Butler, who's been over him. Um, they've been very supportive, communicative, um, they have um, created many opportunities for transparency of information, not as many as we would like, I'll be honest with you. Um, however, it's been a very positive and certainly collaborative process, and we have uh, enjoyed it very much from the, uh, the first day. So it's been very, very positive. Well, that's, that's encouraging to hear. How, how have you all communicated with them uh, throughout the process? Has it been strictly emailed and some face-to-face -face community? Philip is our liaison, and yeah. we, we use him. We, we mostly go through Philip. Yeah. It's been uh, all, of the bun uh, all of the above. Since the beginning, we've had monthly uh, SIT meetings where we have not only had DGS present, but also the architects, as well as members of the SIT. And we've opened it up to the entire uh, neighborhood community as well. And that's been every, every month uh, religiously. Um, in addition to that, we've had uh, ongoing email access, phone access, um, additional meetings whenever was, was necessary. And then I've taken whatever information from that and related on to the rest of the SIT meeting. Uh, SIT group as well as the uh, the community. So and, it's and the PTA every, has been involved in bringing in the broader parent community to help at key points in the process to make sure they give input to the master plan. So we've used whatever means of communication was necessary to communicate and move the project forward. And you say, Mr. Brady, you don't have a, 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 a child who attends. To a I do not. I do not. Okay, okay. that's interesting. I, uh, and how I've, close do you live to the school? Um, I live about. Uh, Three blocks away, about so I'm, I'm very close. It's our local public school. My parents were educators, um, and um, we a long time BC. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the PTA yeah. worked him in. He used to have kids at the school, and we needed an architect to be able to take the lead and be the liaison with DGS. And he was kind enough to come in okay. and offer. I was and just trying to figure out what the what the yeah, with the PTA was. Yeah. put a noose around his neck, pulled him in, and said, "We need you to do well, this well, for us." Yeah. Well, okay. I've clocked over a thousand hours in uh, in the last year on uh, on this project um, because I believe in it, and I know it's a great school, um, and um, and it's a great neighborhood and a great city. My wife would probably agree. She's actually a Stuart Hobson alum. So. Oh, great. Um, I appreciate each of your testimony. Uh, I don't have any additional questions for you at this time. Okay, thank, okay. You. thank, thank you. you very much for your time. Is uh, Valerie Jablo? And I probably butchered your name, and you can feel free to correct me when you get a chance to, to get up here. Is there, I'm going to just make a call. I don't know if you all are here, but I'm going to make a call for Shanika Wilson Ross, Terry Goings, Sylvia Robinson, David Dickinson, Theodore Brown. <laughs> Mark O'Donnell. Not here. He, I believe he submitted a written testimony. Okay. Are there any other uh, public witnesses who wish to testify uh, as to the Department of General Services who have not previously signed up? Then we're going to go ahead and proceed. Ms. Jablo? Hi, thank you. And how, what's the correct way to pronounce your last name? Jablo. Jablo. I think you were there. Okay. <laughs> right. um, Good thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Good afternoon. And um, I am Valerie Jablo, and my two children attend the Capitol Hill Cluster School, which has 1,200 students from pre K through grade 8. 
I am here because the renovation of Stuart Hobson, the Capitol Hill Cluster School's distinguished middle school, is still not finished, as you know. Um, it is the only complete renovation of the school in its 86 years. As you also know, we need $12 million to complete the renovation, including building a much needed addition, making the existing building fully usable, and ensuring the entire outdoor space is a functional athletic area. Without this expenditure, we will be left with a crippled school unable to sufficiently support its students or faculty. I was originally going to talk about funding inequities. After all, capital spending on schools west of Rock Creek Park has dwarfed that in other areas of the city for longer than any of us has been alive. But I'm going to talk about baseball. You see, Stuart Hobson started a baseball team this year. We had to fight DCPS to get uniforms and equipment before the first game, but rest assured, our team has been playing and winning, except the winning part isn't very happy. Most of the DCPS middle schools Stuart Hobson's baseball team plays suffer from some combination of poor coaching or lack of experience or, most damning of all, no outdoor place to practice. Happily, Stuart Hobson has a relatively skilled team because half its members belong to Capitol Hill Little League. That league has worked tirelessly in my Ward 6 neighborhood to secure open space for kids to play the game we call our American pastime. But like those middle school teams for whom we have had to invoke the mercy rule, Stuart Hobson's baseball team has no outdoor place to practice. And if you don't do the right thing with its renovation funding now, our kids will continue to have no outdoor place to practice. Right now, we have both ANC support as well as HPRB approval. Community groups, including Sports on the Hill and Capitol Hill Little League, eagerly support increasing Stuart Hobson's outdoor athletic space. But what we still need is the support of our mayor and council in ensuring this is fully capitalized. That means not just the $6 million for finishing the school building, but $6 million also to do the outdoor athletic area correctly. We are not asking for anything that other recently renovated schools have not received. Imagine for a moment Wilson or Deal without outdoor athletic space. But that is precisely what has been proposed for Stuart Hobson. With that $12 million allocation, Stuart Hobson would have what other recent school renovations have, a multi-use outdoor facility with adequate athletic space for a variety of sports and structural parking for staff. Though $12 million is a relatively large budget increase, our initial budget for this renovation was always a guess. Our kids should not be penalized now because that guess turned out to be wrong in the face of almost a century of neglect and insufficient repairs. As it is, the new total allocation would put Stuart Hobson well within per pupil spending for similar school renovations. This suggests that the initial allocation was not just a guess, but always too small and insufficient. Thank you. Were you, were you finished? Did you want well, I, I was just going to say, you can make this right, so okay. please do it now. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I had asked a number of questions of, of the previous panel who were also here to testify in support of increasing the funding for uh, Stuart Hobson. So I don't have any questions for you. I will note, though, that your testimony differed a little because it, it, it mentioned $12 million as opposed to $6 million. Right. So it would be that this, we need the $6 million to finish the building itself mm -hmm. just to make it fully usable, and then another $6 million to do the outdoor uh, outside. There has been a proposal on the table to spend just a $1 million to recreate what is currently outside. Once that million dollars is spent, nobody is going to ever go back and say, hey, you know what, let's undo that and, and create an outdoor athletic area. Nobody's going to do that because it's a million dollars. But if you spend six million, you can do it the right way right, right now and have it done. So that total is 12 million, six and six. So. All right, well, I appreciate your testimony, uh, and I appreciate all the, the, the parents and and, and even the folks who aren't parents who, who came down to testify on behalf of uh, Stuart Hobson taking time out of your schedules uh, this afternoon to do so. I really appreciate it. Thank you Thank for you. your testimony. Thank you very much.
We're going to hear next from the government witnesses, uh, Director Brian Hanlon, and anyone else who's going to testify on behalf of Department of General Services. And Director Hanlon, if you if you plan plan to have anybody else from your team answer any of the questions, you might want to just ask them to stand yeah. and raise the right hand. So we can a number of people. I'll just ask you to stand up now. Bell and Tanya, you might as well stand I, up. I don't know that I ever swear this many people in outside of the Department well, of General like Services. To, it's but just it's a belt and spender, suspenders <laughs> approach here. All right, if you could all raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give to the Committee on Government Operations is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you all. And please be seated. And Director Hanlon, you can begin whenever you are situated. And good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon. Shall I proceed? Sure. Good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie and members and staff of the Committee on Government Operations. I am Brian J. Hanlon, Director of the Department of General Services, or DGS. Today I am pleased to testify on Mayor Vincent C. Gray's proposed fiscal year 2014 budget for DGS and confidently share that DGS's fiscal year 2014 proposed budget fully addresses the agency's funding needs. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mayor Gray's fiscal year 2014 budget submission focuses on three priorities. One, growing and diversifying the economy. Two, educating our children and preparing our workforce for a new economy. And three, improving the quality of life for all residents. Seated with me today is Robert Seabrooks, our Resource Allocations Officer, and Desiree Towns, my Chief of Staff. DGS's mission is to effectively manage the government of the District of Columbia's real estate portfolio and optimize its assets. While in essence, DGS designs, builds, maintains, and secures district real estate assets, the breadth of our services allows us to positively impact and support a range of goals. These include seeking excellence in design and construction, workforce enhancement, capacity building for small and locally owned companies, smart energy use, and optimization of our portfolio. We believe and are committed to the notion that by reaching towards these broader goals elevates the quality of life for all in the District of Columbia. In fiscal year 2014, the mayor has proposed an operating budget of $397,322,023 for DGS, a 2.3% increase over fiscal year 2013 approved budget of $388,442,000, supporting 675.2 FTEs. The fiscal year 2014 proposed budget includes $262,416,000 in local funds, 128,777,000 in intra district funds and $6,129,000 in special purpose revenue bonds funds rather since DGS implements the capital construction budgets of multiple agencies DGS is responsible for the execution of $553,234,000 in capital projects these funds include $22,100,000 for DGS municipal projects, $437,095,000 for District of Columbia public schools uh, renovations and modernization projects, $49,391,000 for Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, Recreation projects, $16,498,000 for Fire and Emergency Medical Services Department projects, 6500000 for the Metropolitan Police Department projects, 9700000 for Department of Corrections projects, 4000000 for an archives building for the Office of the Secretary, $1,950,000 for the Department of Youth Rehabilitative Services, and $6 million for the Offices of the Unified Communications. While these figures may sound large, DGS pledges our commitment to spend taxpayer dollars effectively and responsibly through best value practices that result in world-class facilities where present and future generations of Washingtonians will le work, learn, and play. In fiscal year 2014, DGS will continue to plan, design, and construct educational facilities for district students at all grade levels. 
We share the mayor's vision that students of all ages deserve educational environments that inspire them to learn and realize their full potential as young citizens. The proposed fiscal year 2014 through fiscal year 2019 capital improvement plan or CIP for DCPS implemented by DGS authorizes $1,784,621,000 with $151,216,000 for new and modernized elementary schools in fiscal year 2014 spread across 16 schools which include Shepherd Elementary School in Ward 4 which is proposed to receive $6,678,000 Houston Elementary School in Ward 7 proposed to receive $9,360,000. Plummer Elementary School also in Ward 7 proposed to receive $9,453,000. And Stanton Elementary School in Ward 8 which is proposed to receive $11,422,000. In fiscal year 2014 the CIP allocates $89,000,000 $354,000 for new and modernized middle, middle schools including Brookland Middle School in Ward 5 which is proposed to receive $37,651,000. Stewart Hobson Middle School in Ward 6 proposed to receive $17,433,000 and Kramer and Johnson Middle Schools in Ward 8 which are proposed to receive $10,205,000 and $11 million respectively in fiscal year 2014. The six-year CIP also authorizes $162,255,000 for new and modernized high schools in fiscal year 2014, including Duke Ellington School of the Arts in Ward 2, which is proposed to receive $27,805,000, Roosevelt High School in Ward 4, proposed to receive $37,686,000, and Ballou Senior High School in Ward 8, which is proposed to receive $85,153,000 in fiscal year 2014. DGS has set the bar high with regard to furthering our shared goals of managing our expenditures in a manner which promotes economic inclusion for district-based companies and job opportunities for district residents. Though the law requires DGS to expend a minimum of 35% of our capital dollars towards certified business enterprises, or CBEs, DGS has established and exceeded an internal goal of a minimum of 50% of these dollars. To date, we have maintained this level across the breadth of our capital program and are beginning to see signs of reaching even higher with these goals. Several of our recent projects have reached levels above 60%. I believe this shows evidence that the marketplace is growing stronger and locally owned contracting firms are ever more able to compete effectively for projects. As part of these initiatives, DGS developed an Access to Capital and Technical Assistance Program in collaboration with the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking, or DISB, and the Department of Small and Local Business Development, or DSLBD. This program, launched as a pilot on the Ballou High School project, is intended to provide qualified small and district-based companies access to a rolling line of credit for the duration of a project to assist with their in internal cash flow which can be a problem for smaller companies. Further, it is intended to provide an array of opportunities with regard to technical assistance in business management. We believe this program will prove to be a success, and as DGS refines it, we will look to expand it across the capital portfolio. Lastly, DGS developed the so-called Workforce Incentive Program, or WIP, that encourages, through monetary incentives, general and subcontractors to hire district residents. First rolled out in the summer of 2011, DGS has successfully expanded this program across our capital portfolio and has, to date, measured approximately 44% of all hours worked on our capital projects by district residents. Beginning this fiscal year, DGS also started monitoring workforce metrics on service contracts on the operating side of the budget. While these projects are not included in the incentive program, they are very successful with district resident participation. For the 17 service contracts we have begun to monitor this fiscal year, district residents are responsible for more than 46% of the hours worked. To further Mayor Gray's Sustainable DC initiative, 
DGS is continuing to be a leader in sustainable design and is on track to receive LEED certification on several school projects, including the modernizations of Cardozo and Dunbar High Schools. In the past year, DGS opened the new municipal office building at 200 I Street Southeast, which achieved LEED Platinum, and the Consolidated Forensics Laboratory, which achieved LEED Gold. The former project has a 70,000 gallon cistern which captures storm water and stores it for use at the adjacent canal park. The latter project similarly uses storm water in its cooling towers and will save approximately 2 million gallons of potable water each year. All of these buildings will provide high quality environments for working, learning, or playing. All will reduce our carbon footprint and each of these building projects will result in proactive preservation, uh, preservation of our financial resources over the years to come. Additionally, DGS has aggressively audited millions of square feet of building space in order to address inefficiencies in equipment performance and to identify strategies based on energy use patterns to modify occupant behavior to achieve savings. Through these strategies and through continued innovative purchasing techniques for the acquisition of commodities such as electricity and natural gas, DGS believes we can continue to drive down our energy and water consumption and over time save money for district taxpayers. Finally, DGS is working diligently to address all types of maintenance issues that may arise in our district owned buildings. We conduct routine and preventative maintenance to keep our buildings running efficiently and emergency maintenance when an unexpected condition arises. Conscientiously maintaining our buildings allows them to function properly requiring less energy use and reduce costs in the long run. DGS's mission includes elevating the quality of life in the district uh, and for district residents. Of our nearly 630 full-time employees, 44% live in the district. And of the 26 hires during the first quarter of this fiscal year, 56% of those employees are district residents. Employing district residents not only supports our neighbors and communities, but it fosters a sense of pride and ownership in the work DGS employees perform. DGS also works collaboratively with the Office of Planning and the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development on revitalizing our communities. This collaboration seeks to activate those vacant properties within our portfolio and to design spaces within our construction projects that enable the community to better utilize them for civic engagement, community meetings, or maintaining a healthy lifestyle. We view each project as an opportunity to engage with the community to improve our design and construction projects. In conclusion, under the leadership of the mayor and with the support of this council, our team is dedicated to safeguarding district taxpayer dollars through best value delivery of services. The mayor's budget allows us to continue this undertaking. I am proud of the work we are doing at the Department of General Services. I'm doubly proud of our staff. I'm inspired by what we will accomplish for the district in the years to come. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would be happy to answer any and all of your questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, Director Hanlon. I have a number of questions, and I think I'm going to sort of start toward the end of my questions because we had a number of parents who came down to testify about schools, and, and I think it might be helpful. Uh, I'm going to begin by thanking you for hosting the brown bag uh, lunch that you, you you held and your staff held uh, here at the Wilson Building a, a little while ago to discuss this process with the council staff. But for the benefit of the public, could you please uh, explain how decisions are made for the school's uh, capital improvements plan? Uh, yes, uh, council member. It's a it's an iterative process and it involves a, a, a collaborative dialogue with uh, the deputy mayor for education's office. Uh, I think the primary voice in the process is the chancellor and DCPS. And of course, we play a role in that we're managing the capital program, and we have a f essentially a fixed number of dollars each year to manage that ca capital program. So it's a very uh, kind of iterative process where we look at uh, trying to deliver a good cross section of uh, high school, elementary, and middle school projects each year to satisfy the needs across the city in a manner that helps us advance the program in, a, in an effective way. I think one of the things that concerns a lot of people when they look at the, uh, the, the, the capital improvement plan uh, is that uh, it seems that you can never count on the, the, the CIP past one fiscal year uh, in terms of having any degree of certainty as to what's going to be constructed. Uh, and so why, why does it seem like the out-year priorities shift so often? 
Well, I, th I think there's a number of contributing factors, and I, if you permit, I'll just kind of run sure. through them. Uh, one is is that I mean, if you go back four or five years, um, the program that we are now in the midst of is really only a couple years old, and there were several years of, of essentially learning a series of lessons about what these buildings require um, and balancing uh, available capital dollars with physical requirements. <coughs> and, and then the, another factor is growing community expectations. Uh, which which uh, which are part of the dialogue. So, as an example, uh, our phase one projects several years ago, uh, on a rule of thumb basis, were uh, the forecasted budgets were at about thirty five dollars a square foot, and that counted for a, uh, a project that was targeted at doing certain types of cosmetic upgrades, which the phase one program was intended to provide. Uh, Focus primarily on classroom areas <coughs> and uh, student learning areas. But as we began to unroll that program, uh, what we found is is that you know there are people that uh, you, they come into the classroom and it looks great, but they want to see the lobby, they want to see it upgraded, they want to. There might be some other spaces that DCPS wants us to provide. Council may occasionally come in and say, "Hey, my community wants this or that." And so what we found is is that number actually grew, and so it grew. I think in uh, the uh, prior fiscal year to about $67 a square foot. And we have now basically, <coughs> uh, I think, reached a point of equilibrium on, on the phase one projects. We've got a, a rule of thumb budgeting for moving forward, and we have right-sized the budget at this point moving forward at about $165 a square foot for the phase one projects. We believe that is a, a number that is that we've, we've kind of gone through a process, a learning curve, and we've arrived at a number that we think is, is prudent. Um, I do want to say as well that there's another kind of pressure on that and that we found that phase one projects and that they occur across an eight week time span in the summer are, are very, very intense projects. And there's only so much work that can be done in that eight week period without swinging students out in a subsequent school year. So this is really part of a balancing act. And, and I think that likewise, uh, you gave an example of the phase projects, but likewise with the high schools, we right-size the budgets. The, the act of right-sizing those budgets uh, has a tumbling effect throughout the CIP, which, which, uh, uh, which caused us to have to work with DCPS and the mayor's office to essentially uh, set a new queuing order or a reprioritization of when schools would occur or when the projects would occur. So that's essentially uh, what we go through. And, and you, you talked about sort of how you get to the budgets and, and the cost per square foot, um, which is important. But in terms of what actually happens or gets constructed or modernized inside of the school, who makes that determination? Is that a DCPS determination or, or someone else? Uh, it's Again, it's part of an iterative process, but largely the program of requirements is established by DCPS. DCPS produces the uh, what we call the ed spec or the educational specification. And of course, our team plays a role in advancing that. And of course, as the gentleman noted earlier, I mean, we, this year alone we've had 85 SIT team meetings. We have probably north of 20 for each project that we do. And, and, uh, and the SIT team does have a voice in the development of the ed spec uh, and the final architectural product. So it's, but it's largely emanating from DCPS. And, and speaking of, of SIT teams, there seems to be a, a sort of a range of opinions as to how uh, that, that process works. Um, and uh, just today you heard uh, one person uh, who was involved in the Shepherd uh, SIT process uh, had really serious concerns about it. And then you heard uh, someone else who was a part of the uh, Stuart Hobson SIT process who spoke very highly of DGS's involvement. Uh, and so, um, and if you want to respond to that before I ask my next question, uh, it's just, it just seems like, you know, uh, in my role as, as, as War 5 council member, we've got a SIT team process going on over at Brookland Middle School, and we've worked with you all uh, on some of the concerns that community has raised. But uh, I take it um, you, you get this experience uh, uh, throughout the city with all the SIT teams that you're engaged in. Yes, I, I would say, um, well, first, I'm, I'm really proud of our, our, our folks and our project managers and, uh, and people on our communication staff that manage the SIT team process. It is, a, uh, it, it is a, a dynamic process, and it requires a special skill set uh, of you know, communication, the ability to you know, balance uh, ever-changing uh, 
uh, you know, a, a concept of, the, of a project. Uh, so I'm really proud of our team. Um, and I, I would venture to say that uh, if you were to look across the, the history of, of the SIT process, it would largely be deemed very, very successful. I would like to actually uh, begin to, to survey uh, SIT team members so that we can continue to uh, actually start to establish uh, some data on some input from folks so we can look to improve it down the road. Well, I think that would be helpful uh, for you all in terms of how you engage uh, the, the SIT team members. I did want to point out, um, Mr. Patterson, I believe his name was, uh, testified earlier that he was he was asked to submit in advance a newsletter uh, for Shepherd uh, Elementary School before he sent it out. Do you know anything about that? Is that a policy or, or uh, something that you all at DGS ask parents to do? No, it's not a policy. And um, I, my understanding of that, first of all, that was the first I'd heard of it. And while we were sitting there, I got I got a communication. I think there was a miscommunication, and I'll I'll speak on behalf of Jackie Stanley, that who was a reference. Jackie's outstanding, and does terrific work for DGS, and is working in communities across the city. And uh, I, I believe there was a, probably a misunderstanding. My 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 understanding was is that she thought that the um, uh, the the newsletter was something that was in the process of being developed and was. Um, trying to trying to see if there were any pictures or things like that that we might be able to contribute, or wanted to do some fact checking so that she could provide info for the newsletter. So I think it was a misunderstanding. Um, we don't ask to screen uh, people's newsletters before they publish them. That's not what we do. Uh, I was hoping that would be your response because I, I work with Jack and Stanley, and members of my staff have worked with Jack and Stanley, and, and we've had nothing but uh, a pleasant experience uh, in working with her. So I was a little. Taken aback when I heard uh, that that there, there may have been uh, some sort of screening that would have been going on with TGS and as it relates to school right. newsletters, which are fairly innocuous, I would imagine. So, um, in terms of the the school blitz funds, uh, how much does, does DGS have uh, allocated to, to perform school blitz over uh, this summer, in in advance of the? Uh, 13, 14 school year? We, we have, um, uh, of the schools that are receiving uh, students, we have about, I think it's $7.841 million uh, for the receiving schools. And those monies are spread across, I think it's about 12 schools that we have. Uh, each school has a, uh, uh, a, a relatively modest scope of work uh, that, it, that is set to re and, and the schools, I should say, um, the receiving school blitz does not supplant the need to also do a, a, any phase modernizations that would occur down the road. I'm sorry, I missed that last point you just made. Well, we're doing relatively modest uh, work this summer in the receiving school blitz, and again, it's about it's $7.8 million. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to just submit that that work does not, um, it does not supplant the need to do any phased renovation work down the road. It's, it's okay. just a relatively modest level of improvements. Okay. And how was the decision uh, on receiving school goods funds made? Who determined where the, those funds would be spent with schools? Well, I'd say it's uh, council members, probably a similar process. Um, the uh, different schools are receiving uh, different numbers of students. And they're each unique. Uh, in some cases, we're just doing very cosmetic upgrades. It might be paint. It might be replacing some ceiling tiles or things of that nature. Other schools, we actually have to move a couple of walls to expand a classroom area or a, or a public or a, a multi-purpose room, things like that. So the uh, the, the work is was done collaboratively with uh, PCPS as they refine their uh, their program or requirements based on the number of students that were going to go to any given school. Okay. And if you could uh, provide the committee uh, a breakdown of the funds for the, the school blitz. Uh, yes, I could do that. Um, and it, you know, I, I, would, I would caution that this might be in some flux, but it's my current breakdown, and we'd be happy to share it with you uh, okay. as well after this hearing. But um, I've got um, uh, the uh, School Without Walls uh, at Francis Stevens. Um, and we're looking at, uh, it's about $308,000 uh, going into that school. Uh, choice at Emory, uh, $100,000. And there's a lot of detail within each of these uh, numbers, so 
rather than read through that, Council Member, I'll, I'll submit that uh, sure. for your review. Uh, Langdon, uh, $608,000, and I'm rounding here, by the way. Uh, Cardozo, uh, $500,000, is receiving some, some modifications because of uh, uh, the receiving school blitz. Uh, Logan, uh, $90,000. Eastern, uh, $500,000. Uh, Ann Goding Prospect, $355,000. Um, we've got uh, ML King is uh, set to receive uh, about $64,000, and there's a bit of contingency there because there's some unknown conditions that we're still working through. Plummer, $530,000. Thomas, $1.5 million. Houston is $50,000, and again, um, we're we're doing some uh, additional uh, engineering work to look at the electrical system, so there's a little bit of contingency there. Uh, $345,000 for Kelly Miller. Uh, Stanton, D.C. Scholars, $2.2 million. And uh, Kramer, uh, $192,000. And likewise with that school, since we're still doing some engineering, there's a, a set aside of a small contingency bucket for that as well. And that uh, adds up to, aggregates to about $7.841 million. Okay, and uh, I note that uh, the committee has been joined by uh, Councilmember Jim Graham of Ward 1, and uh, what we'll do uh, is, is a round of, of 10 minutes, and since I've already been uh, asking some questions, I'm going to finish up this round, and then I'll give you an opportunity if you want to make an opening or, or ask some questions, Councilmember Graham. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, Stuart Hobson, we had a number of parents who, who testified uh, with respect to Stuart Hobson, and they specifically had a request for uh, six million dollars to complete uh, construction. Do you want to speak to uh, the specifics of that request? Actually, Miss um, Ernst testified and had a, a, a list in her testimony with bullets uh, that talked about the things that that uh, that needed to be done. And she specifically uh, mentioned. I don't want to run through each of the things that are in her list, but then we had another person. Uh, testify that uh, that actually there's 12 million dollars that that needs to be in in the budget for for them because there's also a um, uh, the athletic fields outside need to be constructed and so uh, you were here for that testimony you want to speak to that yeah I think um, I, 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 my understanding is and I might actually uh, while I start to speak ask uh, uh, Mel uh, to come up and uh, He's actually uh, one of the project managers that was mentioned uh, during the prior testimony. My understanding is, is that um, most of the improvements that were on that list are, are actually being covered in FY13 and FY14 funding allotments, which equate to uh, an additional about $29.4 million for the school. Um, the, 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 the quantity of uh, dollars, rather, that's, that's not included is for the uh, the underground parking, the structured parking. So, Mel, if I could ask you to, uh, if I've left anything out, just let me know. <clears throat> thank you, Director Hanlon, and thank you, Chairman McDuffie, uh, for allowing us to report today on the Stuart Hobson situation. Specifically, and, and if the, you could, uh, I hate to interrupt, but if you could just say your name for the record. I'm sorry, you. Melvin Butler, Jr. Most folks call me Mel. <laughs> Please feel free to. The Amounts that are requested for FY13 and 14 <coughs> effectively complete the programmatic requirements for Stuart Hobson as requested by and supported by uh, DCPS. The additional $6 million you understood from the witness testimony um, could be characterized as athletic space improvements, but the bulk of that number, using that as an estimate without challenging it in this conversation, is to support an underground parking garage that does provide some slight increase in the overall net play space on the site, but not a significant increase. The important point, I think, uh, Council Member, is that DCPS has not formally endorsed DGS pursuing uh, that portion of the project, this additional six million that impacts that parking garage play space configuration. What DCPS has endorsed and that we've drawn and would pursue is an improvement to the current existing play space and parking configuration 
essentially to the satisfaction of DCPS at this point. And is that the cost of, uh, to the tune of about $1 million? I think somebody testified to it. You probably don't know offhand, but I'm just. I'm we had numbers in the range of four and a half to $5 million for those place based improvements that really wrap up an underground parking garage in that concept. Okay. I was talking about for the, uh, just to enhance the current uh, uh, place space that exists. And if you don't have the numbers, we'll right have now, to go back and yeah, get we'll the detail, get you, uh, get you some detail information okay. for that breakdown, sure. Okay. And, and, and we'll just follow up with you all about, about, that, about that. Now, I um, want to talk a little bit about an, another school, but I'll, I'll wait uh, until the second round to do so. Right now, um, uh, we'll turn it over to Councilman McGrath for any questions you might have. One over there. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to ask questions today. And Director Hamlin, I'm not going to go on and on and on about your superb bow tie. <laughs> but, but it is. It's one of, one of the best, one of the best, uh, Director Hamlin. Likewise. I want to, <laughs> well, my own little humble way, I <laughs> try to be a little stylish, but that's, uh, that breaks a record. It really does. You're and making me blush, Council Member. Oh, good. Yeah. And I'm kind of a natural <laughs> blusher anyway. Uh, and and uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your solid services to the people of the District of Columbia. Uh, really, uh, you're doing a fine job in, in so many areas, and I, I, I know the chairman uh, would agree that, uh, that, that your service is much appreciated. It really is. Uh, and I find it also refreshing, this will be the last compliment, but I, <laughs> I find it also refreshing that you have noted in your testimony the number of people that you're hiring from the District of Columbia who are residents of the District of Columbia. And, and I, I, I just, you know, Mr. Chairman, it would be great to have every director of every agency, and I'm thinking of taking, I have a Human Services Committee, and I, I'm thinking of taking this uh, to my committee. We're having a hearing next Monday, and I'm going to ask the Director of Disability, uh, Department of Disability Services, how many, what her percentages are. It's very, very good. And, and so I commend you for that. Now, um, oh wait, there's one more compliment, but this compliment I'm going to pay to the Mayor of the District of Columbia because it is his uh, uh, response to my request that $200,000 has been made available for improvements at the park uh, of the former site of the Bruce Monroe School. And I've received uh, just today a letter from Jesus Aguirre who uh, has confirmed that and, and we're going to be able to provide new water fountains and a shade structure including seating large enough to accommodate community gatherings and programming. And as you know, uh, Director, this, this park is three acres and you know, I'm, I'm really very proud of what we did there, but there is no shade and uh, so we need to have that. So thank you, Mayor Gray. I hope you're watching this hearing. Mayor Gray, so that you've heard me specifically acknowledge your strong support for the people on Georgia Avenue. Um, Garnett Patterson uh, is, is, you know, in the, f the future of this historic building, which was, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the first African American junior high school in the United States to have a, a separate a, a structure such as this. And it was called a junior high school, that's on the building. It's now, of course, an a middle, what became a middle school, we all understand that terminology. This is a tenth in you, and I have been speaking to, to Chancellor Henderson all along on this, and she's been very forthcoming. And the latest that I'm hearing is there may be a possibility of using Garnett Patterson as swing space for one of the other school renovations. I've heard without confirmation Western uh, slash, well, I shouldn't say Western because it hasn't been Western for a for hundred years. <laughs> Duke Ellington School for the Performing Arts, forgive me, um, and over in Ward 2. But, you know, we don't want a vacant school building in Ward 1. We don't want this. And we want it to be put to productive use. If the school system can use it, that's great. Uh, but. What can you tell me about the latest on this issue? We're moving the students from Shaw Garnett Patterson to Cardozo uh, this fall. Uh, and th then there is no occupant that I know of for Garnett Patterson building, 10th and U. Well, 
council member i don't think i can i can't update you a whole lot more than what you already are aware of that it is being uh, looked at as possible swing space for duke ellington as is meyer um, and any other plans beyond that I, I frankly couldn't answer in any detail now okay well i i did, I did want the opportunity to, to again go on the record about my concerns of a bit an empty building uh, we already have um, people taking over the grassy areas and and um, we don't do well with big empty buildings in Ward 1. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we can really address that issue in a way that uh, keeps that building in some use, even though it's being held in, I know it's being held in the school system uh, for, for good purpose. <clears throat> now I heard you mention in your testimony that Cardozo is going to have an additional $500,000 for its renovation this year. Is that related to this transfer of Shaw Garnett Patterson? That's my understanding that it is it is the uh, uh, part of the receiving school blitz, and there were some you know minor modifications that needed to occur to mm -hmm. to make the school work for uh, the the different student body groups. Mm -hmm. So, but we're on track. Cardozo, the new rehabilitated, re-energized uh, school, is going to be open in August, September. It will be open in August and ready for school this fall and the uh, pool will actually follow in the fall the, the little lap pool that i think you're aware of downstairs will uh you're not talking about that grand historic pool <laughs> I, i've never heard it called the little lap pool has anybody well, ever heard i was being coy <laughs> yes the grand historic pool downstairs will open up for business <laughs> well you know i worked hard to to get the million dollars that made that renovation and restoration possible. And I, I, think, I think a high school should have a swimming pool. I really do. I, we had a swimming pool. I bet all of you had swimming pools. And the notion of not having a swimming pool at Cardozo when we were taking such incredible care with the restoration of the building um, it didn't make sense to me. So that's good news. That's good news that that's going to be available for students at Cardozo and hopefully the community. We'll have there be some community use of the pool, which will, uh, you, you can't have enough swimming pools. You know, can you? Or you can't have too many swimming pools. I mean, people like swimming. Now, I want to turn to the issue, which I know our chairman has, has had testimony on this in the past, on CCNV shelter. Um, I am, I am, it's my intention to convene a hearing on this matter, and you're well aware of this. Uh, so that we can figure out the situation regarding the CCNV shelter. This is a very important facility in the District of Columbia. 1,300 people daily, you know, receive shelter services uh, who would otherwise be on the streets. Uh, it's the largest single center of homeless services in the District of Columbia. It also does a whole lot of other things. There's two women's shelters. There is a recovery center. Um, and, and so, uh, as you know, there is a complexity associated with who owns what and who has rights to what and when are those rights going to expire. And I want to work with you, Chairman McDuffie, uh, so that we can sort all this out. But our interest at the Human Services Committee, of course, is in the quality of services. And uh, I know that there have been improvements there, am I right, in the last uh, uh, period of time? Yes, there, there have been some physical upgrades to the systems, and there are some planned improvements, modest improvements ongoing now. Well, we've got to deal with the, the bigger issue of, of, you know, CCNV has this enormous and very contributing homeless shelter, but then it has a vacant lot behind it, which is a parking lot, and there are buildings alongside on the other street, and uh, uh, we've got to figure all this out. Uh, there's a task force which I thought was going to be established on these issues. Do you know anything? I asked you about this, I think, at the, at the last meeting, last hearing of this committee. Are you aware of the status of that? I, I'm not aware of the current status. I'm aware of a, uh, of a task force, as I understand it, uh, that is looking at all of those issues. But I, I, I'm not uh, in a position to give an update on it at the moment. Well, I have an email from the Deputy Mayor, Bibi Otero, to me on the 25th of March uh, saying that she is going to get back to me and I haven't heard anything back so I guess I have to re I have to ask her 
what the status is of all of this. But, but, but the council and, and our deep concern about the quality of homeless services has a real stake in making sure that this is all uh, done correctly. Uh, my, my staff member, John Detay, has just reminded me, and you've already mentioned this, that the Meyer Elementary building on 11th Street is also uh, possibly going to be vacant. Uh, we have really avoided a vacant Meyer Elementary building since it was uh, closed several years ago. And, and so let me add that to the questions that I've raised about uh, Garnett Patterson. Uh, because if, if, that, if that's going to be part of a swing space that isn't needed right away, then we have a vacant building. I, I uh, hear you loud and clear, and if I could get back to you uh, with a, a bit more detail, I'll say close the business next Friday, I'll have a better idea of what's at play here. We've, we've really been fortunate because we had two other schools close in the last round of closing some years ago. We had Gay Jackington close and Bruce Monroe close. Both of them were uh, in the style of brutalist architecture. You probably, everybody knows what that is now. So we, we didn't like windows. We didn't like windows you could see out of. We didn't like walls. We didn't, you know. And I think both of those structures, uh, despite all the great teaching and education that occurred in both, the structures themselves were no longer appropriate for modern times. So I, I, both of those were demolished. So this is our first experience with empty school building. And it makes me, you know, I'm on the edge a little bit about it. So okay. let's stay in touch, and, and we'll be back to the, the Chancellor about this as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Graham. Just staying on vacant school buildings for a moment, Director Hanlon, how many uh, vacant school buildings is DGS maintaining uh, currently? I would have to um, actually get a, a number for you. Um, that if you permit, I'll by next close business next Friday, I'll give you accurate okay. count. All right. Thank you. That would be helpful. Yep. And I uh, understand, uh, and, and <laughs> we had uh, witnesses uh, testify earlier about the, uh, the need for funds to uh, replace the facility at the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. And um, I was, one of the things that I raised is that the, 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 the facility is not that old. And, and uh, Ms. Barry talked about the material that was used in, in the short lifespan uh, of, the, of the facility. And what, what is DGS's plan at this point, uh, given the, the amount of money that's in the budget um, for the Southeast Center and Center? What, what do you all have in store? Well, well, we're actually in the midst of uh, starting off a design process that will reconfigure uh, and, and modernize the whole site. As Ms. Barry mentioned, the existing building is actually in pretty good shape. Uh, there's probably uh, some modest repairs that need to happen there. The tennis bubbles themselves, uh, they, they had probably a 10-year lifespan, and I bet they're north of 20 years old, or north of 12, rather. And uh, the, what we would intend on replacing them with would be a prefabricated structure sitting on probably a split-phase concrete block or something that's attractive and durable and is going to hold up. So, so it would be a different product. Okay, and so would that different product have a longer lifespan? Uh, yes. Yeah, thirty-year lifespan. You know. Okay. All right. So we'll have to come back in, in, in ten years from now and, and say we need to replace it again. That's the way we like to build things. Okay. Oh, great. We also talked a little bit about the uh, school modernizations, and I believe there's still uh, some obviously some modernizations that are occurring in FY13. When can the council expect to receive the reprogramming number three? Uh, to finish out the school modernizations for FY13. My understanding is is that the reprogramming number three is two to three weeks away, and I'll verify that for you and give you a more complete answer. Okay. And there's a, a number of proposed um, modernizations, phase one modernizations, for schools in FY14. To your knowledge, has the, the mayor uh, secured the funds for the modernization of Langdon in FY14? 
Now, to my knowledge, uh, that is proposed to occur uh, as a modernization, or rather a phase one with a, a small addition, I believe, in FY15. And there's been no discussion, to your knowledge, of, of, of that being moved up to 14? Uh, I, am not, I am not aware of a discussion to move that up to FY14, but I'll confirm whether or not that is occurring between DCPS and the mayor's office. Okay. And if you could respond back to, to, to the committee with that as well, I'd be, be happy to. The department uh, spends about 14 percent of its budget on personnel services, and overall, there's a request to increase the personnel services budget by 1.8 percent from uh, FY 13. However, in getting to that 1.8 percent, there are some large swings in spending, uh, and it seems that you've transferred almost all of your FTEs uh, and the corresponding budget dollars from the regular pay other category. Uh, which is decreasing by six million dollars to the regular pay continuing full-time category uh, which is increasing by 5.4 million dollars uh, what's the advantages uh, and disadvantages of, of that well uh, I, I, I just say that in our first year of existence as an agency a lot of what we did was uh, was focused on refinement of our our FTEs in terms of position descriptions and roles one of the things we found is we had a number of uh, term employees, and the term employees were paid out of the uh, uh, the, uh, kind of the the other bucket, and we transferred them to full time. And uh, the d the advantage of that for us is that it, it aligns you know positions with the agency mission. It gives people a sense of of uh, uh, that you know that they belong in an organization as opposed to sitting on that uh, that fence when it's a term em employee uh, uh, role. So I think that's the advantage of that. And so there's still some, um, I think, 12 FTEs that are going to remain in the regular pay other. Uh, and so are those 12 FTEs a term FTEs? Yeah, we, we do have some seasonal work. And what that allows us to do is, uh, for instance, you know, in the winter when you've got, uh, you may have snow removal services or grass cutting in the summer or, or whatever it might be, uh, it, it allows us to be able to hire more quickly for those seasonal employees that are, that are uh, term in nature, short term in nature. In FY12, the additional gross pay category expenditures were $1.09 million. Uh, only 625000 was budgeted for that purpose in FY13, and that has already been overspent partway through uh, third quarter. What is the additional gross pay category used for? Uh, additional gross pay is used for a category that has to do with shift differentials. We have, we're a 24-7 operation, and there are different rates of pay uh, during the daylight hours and there are at night. And you might have somebody that has a, a, a shift that then tr uh, transitions from, say, afternoon to evening, and shift differential is in that category. If I could, I'd like to actually ask uh, Desiree Towns to expound. Sure. That's correct. We Any employee who's going to be working beyond uh, 7 p.m., I believe it is, from 7 p.m. to say at 7 a.m., would get the time and a half rate, which is the shift of differential. That crosses our lines between the protective services, security division, as well as the facilities division. Okay. And, and will the proposed FY14 allotment of $1.4 million be sufficient uh, given the uh, current spending rate? Um, I will uh, let me let me drill back in. Robert, would you be able to chime in now, or should we get that detail? We could get detail in in a week, but it should be sufficient. We are always tweaking the um, FTE deployment and situation, so um, it would take us. We could probably get you a more detailed answer within a week. Sure. In fiscal year twelve, the overtime pay categories expenditures were two point. Uh, two five million dollars uh, 1.96 million dollars was budgeted in FY 13 and already over 1.3 million dollars has been spent now why, why are the overtime costs so high 
Well, this year, um, I think one of the unique factors this year is we had an inaugural event, and that actually caused a spike in uh, a range of activities, uh, both from PSPD and perhaps especially in our facilities division. Um, and, and we've had a couple of storms, and though we had a, not a lot of snow actually uh, stick on the ground this winter, we had a series of deployments where people are actually out doing a, a, you know, preparation on sidewalks and parking lots, uh, putting down de-icing materials, things like that. That, uh, that has caused uh, our spending rate and over time to be a bit higher than we w would expect in a normal year. Do you uh, anticipate, uh, given uh, where you are at, the, at this point in the fiscal year in 13, what do you anticipate the the uh, 13 expenditures to be based on uh, the current spending rate? We, we have taken a look at that, and we believe, given our current burn rate and where things are, that we should end up at about $2.25 million uh, for that particular category. Okay. And that's going to that's gonna put you at the same rate as you were in, in FY12 when you, when you didn't have an inaugural event. Though. Yeah, we had a, that, that, you know, every year is, is unique. And uh, we had a derecho and uh, a couple of, you know, these, these events, um, and frankly, they're, the storm events are becoming more severe. Um, and you have uh, tree limbs and debris and all sorts of flooding issues, and it, it just causes a spike in activity. Okay. Keeping with uh, personal services, at the previous year's budget hearing, the council was uh, inclined to give DGS some time to determine where it could achieve personnel cost savings, given that uh, it was a relatively new uh, and very large agency. However, uh, there's still approximately 41 vacant FTEs. Has uh, any analysis been done to determine whether all of these vacancies are needed? Uh, yeah, it's actually a, it's part of a, an ongoing conversation in the agency, um, and I, we've been doing a, um, a, a lot of kind of digging and scratching in each division. Um, I, the first thing I'd say is that given an organization of our size, uh, vacancy rates of around 10 to 12 percent are considered normal uh, on a kind of national scale. And we're at, I think, about right now about 8 percent or Six or seven percent vacancy rate, uh, you know, six hundred and uh, uh, seventy-five FTEs, and you know we've got forty-one vacancies. So, from that perspective, we're we're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, we have some uh, some of our divisions have higher than normal rates of vacancy. PSPD, for instance, there's about a thirty-eight percent vacancy rate in PSPD, and part of that is due to we actually just went through a hiring process and brought on a new. Associate Director that will lead the Protective Services Police Department, and we wanted to actually hold off on hiring uh, or refilling those vacancies until that individual was on board. Now that they're on board, they've been with us for about two weeks, you'll start to see an accelerated pace of hiring there. Okay. And since there uh, will be an apparent cost savings of having not paid uh, some of these salaries or fringe uh, for positions, that were vacant half the year, what do you intend to on doing with the, the funds that are going to be available? Well, you know, every year we forecast our budget, you know, say 16 months in advance, and, um, and so there are components of that that are easy to predict, like rent, et cetera, and then there are components that are less easy to predict, like the amount of um, spend on commodities usage, uh, natural gas, electricity, things of that nature, because we can't control uh, consumption. Um, we have events during each year that may cause, like we just discussed, a, a spike in overtime. So we would want to use those funds to offset other pressures that may arise, uh, be they overtime or related to commodities. And I will say that we can always use them. We've, there's always a need in, uh, in, in, in our facilities as well. 
Okay, and and under um, the agency management program, there's a proposed increase of five FTEs for financial services, public education, and for performance management. Uh, what, what are those uh, increases about? Now, those were uh, positions that we reclassified. Um, they were reclassified to agency management uh, so that they had previously been paid out of capital, and we felt it was more appropriate that they pay be paid uh, using local funds. And Des, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no. And so you, they're going to be paid out of local funds going forward? Yeah. Yes, sir. In, in FY12, uh, DGS expended $1.6 million on supplies and materials. Uh, there was an approximately $3.5 million increase in the budget for supplies and materials for FY13, yet less than $1 million of that budget has been spent to date, uh, and we're currently uh, in the third quarter of this fiscal year. Uh, are you projecting unspent funds for fiscal year, for this fiscal year? We are. Okay. You know approximately how much? Um, Approximately how much uh, we'll, we're, we're up? I'm sorry? Yeah, you, you projected unspent funds for fiscal year 13. I'm just wondering. Oh, no, we are not. We are in, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. We are anticipating actually expending those funds. Okay. Do you have any idea sort of on, on the types of things? I guess I'm just trying to, I'm kind of curious as to, um, given that we are already in the third quarter of 13, and you spent less than a million dollars out of 3.5 million. I would, I would uh, say that, um, one, you know, we, we, as I mentioned earlier, you know, in our first year of existence, there was a, a lot of analysis that was done, a lot of kind of refining of our of our um, our divisions and and how we how we functioned as a as a whole agency but also as divisions and uh, this this is a category that falls within you know deputy director Ali Harper who's actually with us uh, has worked hard with his team to uh, take a look at all of our facilities uh, their portfolio needs um, now this particular category is one of those that is seasonal in nature and so you see You'll see a spike in uh, in um, or an uptick uh, uptick in spending depending on the, the month that you're in. And we're also working, I want to say, with our project managers and our line managers to make sure that they they get uh, our vendors and our contractors to submit invoices in a more timely manner. So we're trying to refine the, the systems, but I'm I'm confident that we're gonna we're gonna expend these funds. Okay, and and you also request an increase. Uh, in your allocations to $5.5 million for supplies and materials? Yeah, I would say that I was trying to allude to, to that a moment ago that um, one of the things that Mr. Harper and his team have done is as we, you know, we, we acquired a large segment of our portfolio when DGS was formed that had uh, prior to that not really had a one consistent level of care and routine maintenance um, uh, paid to it. And so part of our challenge in that first year was making sure that, that we did uh, try to do a, a, a detailed assessment and analysis of, of the whole portfolio and its needs. So this number is a reflection of the analysis that uh, Mr. Harper and his team have, have gone through. One of the things I noticed was that there's in um, in the NPS one of the things that I noticed about um, the NPS was, was there's an there's an increase 
in the rentals dash land and structures budget line of almost five million dollars uh, what's, what's that attributable to that is actually attributable to leases which go up there are cost increases to leases over time um, and we'd be happy to share with you a copy of our our, our leased portfolio and so you can get a look at the, the schedule of uh, leases okay that'd be helpful under the other services and charges uh, in fiscal year 12 there were actual expenditures of 5.2 million dollars FY13's approved budget was for $6.9 million. Uh, to date, only $1.6 million of that budget has been spent. Uh, do you anticipate having unspent funds in this category? Uh, no, sir, I do not. Okay. And, and you, why exactly are you requesting an increase of $8.2 million for FY14? Well, I, I would. Um my answer here is frankly similar to the, the one I gave uh, for supplies and materials a moment ago. It's, it's related to the same effort that uh, you have um, in terms of where we are in our burn rate on the money. There is a seasonal uh, 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 quality to, to the burn rate, and uh, part of it is attributable to we're, we're working to improve our, our line management practices with vendors so they invoice in a more timely way. And then Lastly, I'd say that uh, we have done a, an awful lot of work to look at the whole portfolio so that the, the numbers that we're forecasting are based on what we think is real need. Do you anticipate that there will be insufficient funds in 13 to do some of these things where the budget is increasing? Uh, fairly substantially in in, in 14 uh, no sir I, we're gonna we're gonna meet our mission this year um, and if we have to uh, you know we, we there are buckets that we uh, some some buckets burn faster than others and uh, we always are kind of readjusting throughout the year but we'll we'll make it through this year fine and what does the, the RFK DC Armory maintenance uh, entail. Why do you expect to spend 1.36 million dollars uh, less uh, for that in the FY14? We we have had an agreement with uh, DC Events for the last several years. Uh, in fact, uh, DGS actually uh, occupied part of RFK for a while. But uh, we, DGS actually, on behalf of DC Events, uh, does a number of things related to maintenance and. Uh, security patrol around RFK. Uh, we've done it for a couple of years. Um, we've kind of hit a point where we've uh, reached a, an understanding of what level of uh, care is needed in terms of maintenance and security. So those numbers have been calibrated to what we believe we will require. And with respect to uh, the Protective Services Division, can you uh, talk about why uh, it requires a $1.85 million increase in FY14 with no corresponding increase in FTEs? Uh, it's largely attributable, uh, sir, to uh, contract rates, which go up. The uh, PSPD has about 111 uh, FTE positions, and then there is a about a $24 million uh, contract for security. So the folks that you walk past when you come into district buildings are often um, contract security guards. Uh, and so those contracts go up year, you know, each year. Uh, we also had some, uh, there were some, uh, uh, I believe, some findings from a, a, a grant study that, that identified some, some gaps. And I, I can't speak directly to that, but that's my understanding that uh, some of that funding is to is to close some some gaps uh, in our security apparatus. And and you said the findings were those findings compiled in some sort of report. I believe so. Um, and Robert, are you able to speak to that, or should we, we could we could okay. provide it for you close the business that, next that, Friday? If that would okay. be uh, that would be good. Thank you. Is there anything that you can uh, attribute for the $2.2 million drop in the allocation for natural gas? Uh, 
Yeah, I would say uh, we have a we have a sustainability and energy team. It's led by Sam Brooks, and he's done a lot of great work. And one of the things that he's done is he's negotiated uh, a better contract with uh, uh, for natural gas. And and that's you know step one is is uh, get better rates. And part of the rest of our effort is is uh, there'll be a large focus on trying to impact consumption. But it, it's a new contract. That's a, a pretty substantial drop. Uh, how much other stuff is, is Sam working on where, where we can find those types of drops? <laughs> Electricity. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good. I'm trying to get him to work on my kid's tuition bill. <laughs> <laughs> how, how much of your budget is devoted to maintenance uh, of facilities? And can you elaborate on whether you feel the district is adequately budgeting for the maintenance of its facilities? Well, yeah. I, first, I, the... The total budget for our facilities division is about 108 million, and of that, we've actually uh, I've spent some time with Ali earlier, uh, kind of honing in on that. About 96 million of that is actually spent directly on routine maintenance. Uh, I want to say that I'm grateful for the levels of funding that we've gotten for routine maintenance uh, uh, this past year um, and in the first year of DGS. And and uh, and hopefully in this coming year we've seen uh, increases, and those increases have allowed us to continue to meet what we believe is the most prudent way to care for our facilities. And we've done a, a lot of analyses, and what we've determined that uh, we'll, we'll you know we're probably about 18 million dollars shy of uh, what we need it to uh, to fully address all of our facility needs, but. The monies that we do have are, have uh, enabled us to really uh, grow by leaps and bounds. So um, I'm confident that what's been budgeted is going to be uh, sufficient for us. Uh, along those of those lines, uh, has DGS developed a, a master facilities plan uh, that shows all the district's properties, values, and short, mid, and long-term plans for them? Uh, Council Member, we're in the uh, process of actually uh, putting, starting to put that together now, and it, there's two components to it. There's a, a public safety facilities plan where, where things are being looked at that are public safety in nature, and then a, uh, a master facilities plan for the balance of municipal fi facilities. And of course, there was a school facility master plan that was done last year, so ours will be focused on the municipal side. I believe uh, we'll be getting underway uh, with procuring services in the next couple of months, and we anticipate, I think, uh, by mid next year, that that analysis will be complete and we'll be able to uh, make it public. And. DGS appears to have several projects that have received allotments uh, that have gone unused. And if you could, I'd like you to tell me the status of the following projects. Is a facility conditions assessment project uh, that received $2.7 million in FY13 and still has $2.7 million that has not been encumbered by a contract? We are, um, we are updating our, our facility condition assessments and we actually just went through a procurement to bring on uh, folks to to do that for us, and we're anticipating spending about a third of that 2.7 million dollars this year, and we'll then spend the rest in the balance of uh, next year. And so, is, is is there a contract in place? I will verify that for you, sir, and, uh, and, and get it to you. We'll close the business next Friday. How about the uh, HVAC refurbishment? project that, that received $850,000 in, in FY13 and none of the budget has been spent uh, on Cumber today. I, I believe that that work is underway and actually I'd like to ask um, uh, June Locker to come up and assist with, uh, with answering that. Sure. June is uh, Deputy Director for Construction, for Capital sure. Construction. So. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman McDuffie. Uh, yes, uh, we are currently in design uh, for some HVAC uh, replacements. Um, part of one of the projects will be at the Reeve Center. We're currently in design. We anticipate to be in construction this summer. 
Okay, and is the plan to complete it uh, in FY13 or is that going to be carried over? The majority will be completed in 13. Uh, how about the DPR and DYRS headquarters project? Yeah, we, we actually um, we had looked at locating them uh, in a close school building. And um, after working with both agencies, um, what we found was is that location did not work uh, in an optimal way for DYRS. So we're now in the process of actually upgrading. Uh, the D D DYRS has a, has a, a program that uh, you know, really requires uh, proximity to metro. It needs to be, frankly, in an area that's away from where there's any turf battles going on, things like that. So um, I've worked with Director Stanley, and we're, we're actually keeping them uh, in their current headquarters, which I think is 450H Northwest and we're upgrading that space for them, and they're very happy with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I believe there was $8 million that was budgeted for, uh, for that renovation, and that, those dollars have, as I understand it, been reprioritized uh, by the mayor. Okay. Hazardous material abatement pool, uh, $600,000 uh, allocated in FY13, and there's been a total balance of seven hundred. dollars and 24,000 in the budget. Well, I guess I'd, I'm going to ask June to expound, but I guess I'd start by saying that in that, in, you know, that pool, we, we have a, 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 a fairly good idea uh, based on uh, facility condition assessments that we conducted uh, back in 2009 of what we have facing us. Um, and so we, we, uh, uh, we, we believe that we'll, you know, continue to churn through those dollars this year, and then every every year thereafter. And June, did, would you be able to expound? Uh, uh, yes, uh, the the allotments are determined by DGS, okay. and uh, the, the five hundred thousand. Um, we use this, these funds as issues arise with um, many of our construction projects and facilities as we encounter them, and, and that's how we use the, these funds. Okay. And, and I guess, so what's the thought that goes into is it? Uh, how, how do you arrive at that $500,000 number that you need? Because uh, I think it's 500000 per year uh, for FY14 through 19. Well, it's, it's you know, uh, truth is it's a good guess. I mean, it's, it's based on what we understand about our facilities and the types of things that we deal with on a year in and year out basis. Um, it could be a much higher number if we were to do, uh, you know, if we were to start, uh, you know, digging holes around all of our buildings and we find things. And, but so it's it's a good solid guess and it allows us to, to keep after the, the program. Okay. Uh, next uh, is the ADA compliance pool. There was seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars allotted in FY thirteen, but the project has one point eight six million dollars that has not been spent or encumbered. Uh, and so the, the same idea is: Does this project need to continue receiving six hundred thousand per year? We we continue to have needs to address ADA concerns around our whole portfolio, and I'll ask June to expound on the the current burn rate and then thereafter. Uh, yes, we uh, work with uh, ODR uh, to come up with the projects that we work on, and that is. Um, And ODR provides uh, the, and identifies the deficiencies, and we are the ones who implement it. So there are a few prop, uh, projects that we are, out of the $1.86 million we're working with right now uh, with ODR. And how do you all use these funds? Are, are these funds used uh, specifically where there are issues arise uh, uh, with respect to ADA compliance, or uh, are they used on projects where there may be some targeted, like if you're modernizing a school, uh, or some other uh, a building that, that uh, lacks some aspect of ADA compliance? What, what they are used for primarily is for, um, you know, we, we've, we've got uh, folks that have uh, continued to go around and look at facilities, existing buildings, for uh, things that need to be corrected or brought up to date. Uh, anything that we're uh, designing now uh, would, of course, be uh, designed and built to full compliance with, with the current uh, law. And if I may add, sure. uh, there are three projects that we're currently working on with ODR uh, to use that $1.6 million. Um, they are Federal City, uh, some of the senior wellness centers, 
need uh, to be addressed and uh, B Street. Okay. Next, we've got the uh, critical system replacement. Uh, this project receives $3.7 million in FY13. The project has $5.4 million of budget uh, that has not been spent. And I think there's an additional $7.5 million uh, in the budget for FY14. Yeah, I may, I may need, you know, this is an area where June will probably expound as well. But I, my understanding is that we have about 10 projects that have been uh, queued up to get underway, and can you add to uh, where we are in that? Sure. Uh, most of the projects are either in design, um, some are so, some are, are in, in construction right now. Um, so I could either I can list some of the projects that we're working on, which is the OJS. Uh, uh, if well, you I guess prefer, we could give you. Yeah, uh, you can just okay. you can provide that to the committee later. But give you uh, detail. But the, the, in terms of the the seven point five million for fourteen. Um, There'll, there'll be plans, or there'll, there'll be. Yes. There is more need money. than there are funds. I mean, okay. it's yeah. We'll 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 need every dime of that. Okay. And the uh, CFL uh, is this? Is it the, the project completed? Uh, uh, yes, sir. It was uh, completed and occupied last fall, and um, uh, actually won a number of awards. Okay, and and is is all the money associated with that project been spent? Uh, there was uh, there were monies left over. Um, my understanding is is that uh, the majority of those dollars uh, was were actually redirected to uh, other priorities, and uh, there's a small bucket of money that's there just for kind of closeout items at the at the pro at the at the building. Do you know how much has been redirected and how much is left? If you'll permit, I could get you a more detailed answer on how much has been redirected. Okay. And this sort of touches on where uh, uh, Councilmember Graham had raised some concerns earlier about the uh, shelter uh, and transition housing pool. It has approximately four million dollars of budget. That has not been spent on coming with a contract. Um, there doesn't seem to be any allotments planned for fiscal year 14 through 19. What's the status of these funds? Well, June actually has a, uh, a list, and we can provide you with detail later, or we can run through it now. Uh, well, I'll take the details later. Okay. Um, but but definitely. But there is there is a plan for them, and we'll we'll provide that to you. Okay. And this is sort of an aside, but I know we had talked during the performance oversight hearing about, you know, when, as it relates to CCMB or any other plans to to construct uh, any shelter transition of housing to try to make sure we, we, we see if there are opportunities for some of the clients there to, to perhaps get some work. Uh, I know you had talked about a program where you all had, had, had utilized uh, some of the uh, the residents uh, to, to help with some of the construction in the past. And we have. And that's just something I think is important, and, and I'd like to know more details of uh, and whether or not that was successful, I think you said it was. It was very and successful. And whether or not you plan to continue that model in the future? I would say yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Um, I love to just hear, you know, uh, at some point later, um, how you plan to do so, and, and 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 what aspects of that type of program we might be able to replicate going forward. Would be happy to spend time with you on that. Okay. This is sort of a general question that, that I like to, to ask. Uh, what percentage of DGS projects are completed within budget? Is that something that you all keep a record of? Uh, how many of the projects are completed in budget? Uh, yeah, I, my my sense is is that the percentage of our projects within budget is probably around 97, 98 percent, and that that is uh, that is taking into account that uh, you know. We have um, initial initial project budget budgeting, and then we have a CIP and an approved budget, and then we start a design process, and sometimes that design process leads to budget adjustments uh, that are a result of uh, program enhancements from DCPS or from the community, 
or from our user group or whomever. Um, and and occasionally we'll have uh, unforeseen conditions and things that result in change orders. And so the, the final result may be a number that's different than what was budgeted, say, several years prior. I don't consider that to be a budget bust. I consider that to be part of a fluid process that we are always within. Um, so if you take all that into account, my, my uh, answer is, is that we're probably around 97, 98 percent. What, what about the, the number of projects, uh, percentage as it relates to completing projects on time? One of the things I hear, I've heard from some of the parents and SIT teams that they feel like things have been rushed and um, perhaps things ought to get, kind of get done on time. I've heard it from folks associated with the Brooklyn Middle School, and it's my understanding you all have a pretty good track record of, of getting things done uh, on budget on time, particularly on time. Uh, how do you respond to, to, to some of the concerns that folks have raised about that? Well, I'd say, you know, for one, this is not this is not a business for the faint of heart. I mean, uh, when you walk into a, a phase one project on July 20th, uh, unless you are you're, you're, have a seasoned set of eyes, you're going to look at it and say, this is impossible. There's no way they're going to finish. Um, and, and you, the, you know, the parents are right that, that there is a degree of eight weeks to get these phase ones done is a huge undertaking. It's, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking. Um, if I could wave a wand, I'd swing the kids out and, uh, you know, we'd, we'd do it all at once or, or we'd, we'd open it up in October or November. But I don't have a wand and I, you know, so it, it leads to a, a very, very uh, uh, aggressive process. But I will say this, that we've never failed to open a school on time. And uh, I'm proud of that. I want to talk um, about a couple of agencies and, and plans to move. Uh, there, there have been some reports about the Public Service Commission moving. Thanks, and we talked a little bit with them about that earlier. Um, are you all, uh, what, what's your involvement in that, in that process? Our portfolio division is, is actually working with uh, uh, the Public Service Commission, um, and uh, I've got I've got a, a kind of a basic understanding of uh, of some of the dynamics there. If you'd like me to expound, sure. Yeah, that's. But basically, what what my understanding is is that the Public Service Commission um, they do have uh, they do have concerns about their location. Um, they have uh, stated strongly that they they believe they need to be in the central business district uh, which is um, they've got a customer interface function they want to be near mass transit metro uh, the downtown area allows them to have close proximity to other utilities like washington gas and pepco so that's we're working with them to help them achieve that I see that there are funds allocated for the Public Employees Relations Board to move in FR14 uh, to what it looks like is OJS. I assume that's uh, one Judiciary Square. That, that would be one Judiciary Square. Um, when they move, will the Office of Employee Fields, who are also looking for space, be able to build out uh, into the the perps vacated space? Is that something that you all have discussed at all? If, if you'll permit, I'll, I'll have to actually drill in on that one with our portfolio division. Okay. Uh, get you more detail. And, and while you're drilling on that one, if you could uh, look at uh, where you are in terms of securing space for the Board of Elections. I know there's been an ongoing conversation with them as well. Is there any status updates as to where you are then? Or? I don't have one now, but I'd be glad to get one for you. Director, uh, we've heard some concerns uh, from small businesses that uh, some of the difficulty they've had in competing for contracts uh, is, is 
as you can describe it, sort of this batch style uh, process that's used on some of the projects. Uh, for example, the, the Play DC project, I believe, uh, could have been split among different playgrounds, but rather was, and this is to my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was done as one project. Um, if you could describe for the committee what, what the advantages and disadvantages do you see in, in using that batch style process? The batch style, um, on that particular initiative, uh, what we, we looked at was a, uh, a, a series of projects that had to be uh, planned, coordinated, and implemented in a, rel in a very short time frame. And so that's what is often, um, I don't want to use the word misunderstood, but that's, that's what I'll use, is, is that smaller projects uh, don't require the same level of uh, sophistication or management capacity and and, o and often the smaller more intense ones are just as uh, re require the same level as a, as a large building um, on that we felt that in order to implement this very aggressive uh, program and the schedule it required that it, it was best to to put them out in batches um, you, you talked a lot about the, the work that you're doing to increase um, CBE participation is very laudable. Uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, the, the minimum is, is 35 percent uh, of capital dollars, but you all are, are, have established and exceeded an internal goal of a minimum of 50 percent. Yes, sir. Uh, and I think you deserve credit for that. Um, um, there, there still are concerns about um, opportunities uh, to participate by some of the folks in the CBE community on some of these projects. Uh, I get concerns about how many times a particular general contractor is selected on, on certain projects and, and who they like to use as subs. Um, uh, there's a host of things that I hear. I, I imagine you probably hear it as well. Uh, but I did want to give you an opportunity just to respond to some of the concerns that, that I get as chair of the Committee of Government Operations with oversight of your agency, and I imagine you get sometimes as the director uh, of the agency uh, that does these projects. I, I do, and we, we actually, I have to say, I think we've um, continued to ramp up um, the, the outreach that we conduct with the small locally owned business community. We had four events last year. We'll continue, we'll have four events this year. Um, those events are intended to um, uh, get people familiarized with how do they engage with DGS, how do they become familiarized with projects. Um, on each uh, project, especially the larger ones, we have sub uh, smaller events where we, we basically create a meet and greet and we do a lot of uh, encouragement of small contractors meeting the large contractors. And I, you know, I, I, I'm certain it is a human thing for uh, for anyone to want to do business with whom they've had success in the past. Um, and so what we have to do is, is, to, is to get people to, to be comfortable uh, meeting new, new, new groups, new companies, and, and, um, and trying to forge new ground. And it, it's a process that uh, we have to stay vigilant with and, and keep, keep after. And I do not have any additional questions for you at this time. Is there anything that you would like to add to the record before we conclude this hearing? Uh, no, sir. I think uh, I think we've done it. Thank you. Okay. Well, Director Hanlon, I appreciate your testimony here today, and I appreciate the testimony of your staff members uh, as well. Thank you, Council Member. That concludes the uh, Committee of Government Operations hearing uh, of the Department of General Services. Prior to that, we had the Office of People's Council, the Public Service Commission, and the Office of Partnerships and Grants. The time is now 2.58 p.m., and this hearing is adjourned.